you have some issues? Angie, are we ready? <coughs> okay, we're going to get started and uh, call this meeting to order. We have all of our trustees present today, and we have quite a number of guests. Welcome to all of you. I think I know why some of you are here, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be fun to hear about our longevity. Um, we've got a lot of people who have been with us a long time, and that makes such a difference for the college. Um, do you want to take that first, or do the hearing of citizens first? Probably hearings of citizens first. Okay, we'll go to hearing of citizens, and we do have three speakers today, and our first one is Matthew Weir. Good afternoon. Um, the reason I'm speaking in front of you guys today is uh, in regards to uh, student housing. Um, I heard it was a uh, topic of discussion and uh, you know, potential for the future. Um, and I'm speaking for it uh, because I believe that'd be a great addition for uh, incoming students. Um, so I am from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So when I came out here, um, my parents were very nervous. Uh, it was really far away. Um, and I came after my freshman year at college and I stayed home so I could buckle down uh, and I stayed local. Um, you know, once I proved to my parents that I was responsible enough to come out here, um, like I said, they were very nervous and they wanted me to live in a place where uh, there was more structure. Um, and especially coming from across the country, it was very difficult to find uh, guaranteed housing, something that uh, you know, I could really know the ins and outs of. Um, so I resorted to finding uh, random roommates on Craigslist. And um, it's a little risky. Um, my situation definitely could have been worse, but it definitely could have been better. Um, I never met the roommates before I moved in, um, and I wasn't exactly sure, uh, you know, how all the commotion that Isla Vista brings. Um, I understand that there are apartments that are affiliated and that you guys recommend, uh, like Beach City and Tropicana Gardens, but um, like they were very expensive for my parents, and you know it was cheaper to find, you know, my own lease. Uh, with a landlord, um, you know, and that's, Isla Vista is a beautiful community, but uh, for a young student, it just brought a lot of distractions, you know, beyond the partying and the loud noises that's inevitable with young students living on their own, um, which a lot do because of the pricing of, uh, you know, Beach City and Tropicana. Um, I also had to take the buses, um, which is about 35, 40 minute commute, uh, you know, which isn't the end of the world, but it, it really threw a wrench in my day when I was starting off because um, I had to wake up three hours before my class, get ready. Uh, it took me a while to get used to the bus schedule. Um, and uh, so I think if the student housing was implemented here, uh, number one, it would bring in a lot more, um, a lot more freshmen and create their, or allow their parents to be more comfortable. Um, Freshmen would be able to stay more focused, being able to walk to school, being closer to the to the campus. Um, there would be a lower cost in transportation because not as many people would be taking the buses, so um, there'd be less bus lines that would have to be run. Um, and I think uh, you know it may have affected my grades a little bit last year, um, trying to balance all the things, especially like just moving here. Um, yeah, so if. Uh, if there were dorm dormitories for, for freshmen, um, you know, I think it would help uh, enrollment um, and parents allowing their, their kids to go off to college here. Um, that's all the points that I had in my experience. Uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate okay. it. Um, Matthew, I just wanted to mention one thing. You said that there are uh, apartments affiliated. We don't have any affiliated apartments. There are uh, places that people might look into to live that are on the website, that's oh, okay, correct. Yeah. But we do not affiliate with anybody. Um, oh, okay, yeah. okay. The, the recommended departments then? Not even recommended, just <laughs> this is a list. <laughs> a list. <laughs> yes, it's a list to help people know what might be out there. Okay, but, okay. thanks. Any, any other questions? questions? Yeah, Matthew, you made a statement that 
whenever young people get together, there's bound to be, I think you used the term inevitable. It's inevitable that there's going to be a lot of noise. And the question I have for you is, how inevitable is that? Is, are, there, are there things that could be done to mitigate that? Because that's, that's the issue mm -hmm. that people in our community here are concerned about, that if we, if we create student housing here, uh, that it will automatically be transformed into, and they use the term another Isla Vista, mm -hmm. meaning that it's going to be loud mm -hmm. and disruptive. Yeah, and that's, that's absolutely, you know, a potential concern. Um, I did everything, I had everything ready to go. Last minute, I wanted to change my major. And <coughs> coming from Monterey, I wanted something new. So SBCC seemed like the perfect opportunity. I spent almost all summer looking for housing on Craigslist, rent.com, like asking friends of friends, anything, and I couldn't find anything. And I was so discouraged that I almost did go to Berkeley because I had everything set up, ready to go. Thank God, last minute. I did find people and I did find housing and that's why I'm here in front of you today. And I feel like if I had a better transition and an easier way to get to SBCC, then I wouldn't even thought about going to Berkeley. Um, and also if you have housing near campus, then you can maybe clear up some of the parking issues here. So people aren't driving from Isla Vista or from downtown or from anywhere in Santa Barbara. People can just walk to school and that's two birds and one stone. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. And Emily, you wanted to speak? Um, and I'm doing this under public comment just to explain Emily's one, our student trustee, but we do not have an agenda item for student housing today, so that makes it appropriate for public comment. Can I stay here? You can sit there. <laughs> I'll, be <re> <laughs> I'll be reading this on behalf of uh, Tyler Gibson, our former student trustee. So, dear President Vivi and Board of Trustees, I hope this letter finds you in good spirits and as you discuss goals for the upcoming academic year at Santa Barbara City College. During last year's board retreat, I shared my struggle to find home before school started. I explained how the search for adequate housing is a draining process that wrecks, wreaks havoc on student lives and grade point averages. I encourage the board to participate in a community exchange that would better foster opportunity for all, especially our homeless students, staff, and faculty. Today, I beat the same drum. During the next school year, it is my sincere hope that the board will include and address the undeniable need for, for purpose-built student housing in the Santa Barbara area. In mission, William Gibson, also known as Tyler. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Emily. Um, Craig? Yes, I listened to what Kate Winters uh, uh, said a, few, a couple minutes ago, and um, I was uh, intrigued, and I kind of had a question, um, area of uh, question. Um, she mentioned several times, I don't think you need to come up, but several times you mentioned that um, it would have been so much easier if there was housing here, it would have been simpler, it be easier for students to come here, and yet it seems to me that the that we, we have uh, critics in our community that, that point to the the population of students here as a problem for them. And um, if we make it easier, do we make that problem worse? And I, this is a big, big question for the board and how we have to look at this because we have to communicate with our district that we serve as well as fulfill our responsibilities to the state. And, uh, but above all that, our concern is for the students because that's why we're here. And, um, 
it's it's a big question. Like if we do that and make and solve the problem for you, not saying that we can just snap our fingers and do that, but if we do that, do we create or exacerbate another issue? And so this is a topic that's going to, I think, take quite a bit of consideration on the part of the board and work time to work through. I wish it was simple because, but if it was, then I wouldn't have a job, right? <laughs> and uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Craig. You're correct. It is a complex problem with a lot of viewpoints. So uh, I think now we can move on to recognitions. Anthony? Great, I'm glad to do that. Um, first person that I'd like to, to recognize is Dr. Jack Freelander. And I know Jack's here today, and I just wanted to say a little bit about him. I've known Jack for, for quite a while. I mean, he was, I think it's about 10 or 12 years now when you were down in San Diego um, on a on a uh, conference, I think it was, and we sat together. Um, Jack was hired in 1986 by Peter McDougall, and he has served in a variety of positions over the 30 years that he's been here, starting as a Dean of Academic Affairs for the Fine Arts and Social Science Foreign Language Division. I think he had study abroad there too, some other things. You know, in truth, though, as many folks here know, Jack served as a dean or an interim dean of just about every program and department in the whole college at some point or another during that 30-year period. I think with the exception of math, um, English, and science divisions, I think those are the only ones. But the rest of them, I think you've, you've done some kind of a stint there. Um, in 1996, Jack was selected as the vice president for academic affairs, and then in 2000, Upon the retirement of uh, the former Vice President of Student Services, Jack assumed the newly created position of Executive Vice President, um, which merged both, it was a very unique model because it merged both the Academic Affairs and the Student Services divisions under one Vice President, which was very unique, and then the programs were called uh, educational programs, um, really merging the two, which I think was a, a brilliant idea. And Jack. Um, also served, he wasn't done with just those positions, I mean he also served as uh, acting college president for the academic year of 2011-2012 and during that time his leadership resulted in preparing the proposal for the Aspen Community College Excell Excellence Award which we co-won with uh, Walla Walla Community College and it's certainly a, a badge of honor for the college that uh, will always be there. Um, while serving as, a, as acting president, he worked with Joe Sullivan and his staff and trustees Kroninger and, and Mackle, I think it was, to come up with a more transparent budget process. And he also worked with uh, board president Peter Hasland to build closer ties to the community. And this is during one of the more difficult periods of the college's history. Um, and they, nav they managed to navigate that and do an excellent job of of keeping things together. He's also been uh, a major uh, proponent of the dual enrollment system that we have and actually helped grow that to one of the largest dual enrollment programs in the state of California. And he was a kind of the visionary for the Get Focused, Stay Focused initiative, um, which is now serving, by the way, almost a half a million students in 250 high schools across the United States. So that achievement alone um, is quite extraordinary. I mean, I could go on and on and on with uh, what you've done with the four-year schools, um, you know, the grants that you've run, the, or won, the, the research that you've done, Jack. But Jack tells me that the thing that he's most proud of, and that's the top of the list of all of those accomplishments, is his role that he's played in hiring just outstanding faculty, staff, and managers over that 30-year that period of time, and it's been quite a number that you've been involved with. So Jack, for all of those things, we wanna, we wanna thank you for your 30 years of, of longevity and uh, all that you've done for Santa Barbara City College. So thank you very much. after 30 years, I've earned a trip to the podium, huh? 
We'll add that to your yeah. list. <laughs> I'll be brief, so I'll make, sure, I'll make sure it's a round trip, so I don't dominate the agenda okay. you know, you know, for, for doing that. Um, yeah, the 30 years has been um, gone past. And, you know, I was reflecting on the 30 years and, you know, all the programs and initiatives um, and things that, and they, every time um, I thought of something, I always thought about faculty, managers, staff, um, board members, um, um, presidents, past and present, um, foundation leaders, past and present, who had a major role in taking the ideas um, and making them better and implementing them. And so, um, and so I kept on having flashbacks about you know, each of these people. And um, I guess a, a proud, proud moment for me is when we were visited twice by the Aspen Institute. The first time, we were in the top 10 community colleges in the nation, the only one in California. And the second time, when we were co-winners. Um, and follow-up visits also by um, um, the Gates Foundation and other foundations and um, you know, leaders to learn what's special about this place. And what they all concluded was um, there's something different about this college, something special. It's got um, a culture of innovation, of trying things, and always trying to improve themselves. And I felt really proud of you know, a role I might have played in helping to create that. It was a, you know, everybody's involved in that. But it was great to be in that kind of institution that has that. So that was enough on reflection. Going forward, um, you know, we're hitting a little tough time right now in terms of um, enrollments, which affects um, budget. Other community colleges have or will have um, the same encounters due to demographics and economy and other factors. So my focus now, among other things, is saying, look, it's um, an opportunity to look at how can we more, f um, what can we do to uh, more effectively fulfill our missions? You know, and how can we deal with our enrollment issues and challenges um, better serving our local community in different ways, um, different demographics, and hopefully, um, you know, I'll be, I'm writing about that now because I think it has major implications for um, not only here but public policy um, here and, and throughout the country. And I'll be sharing that with Anthony, and hopefully at some point I can give you specific ideas that we can use here, but I think others can use um, as well. Because, um, you know, these kinds of challenges, our college has always risen to the occasion, and we will uh, here as well. And by the way, he made a great choice in, um, in Dr. Beebe um, as our new president, so I'm really happy that you know, we have him here. So thank you. Thank you, Jack. Here you go. Oh, great. So I'd like to ask uh, Paul Bishop to come down and, and uh, honor Dan Watkins, if you would. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to honor Dan Watkins for 15 years of service. That's half of 30. So I guess the next time I'll be up here, it'll be 30 for Dan. <laughs> That'll be like 90 for me. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like a lot of our employees, Dan's you know, relationship with the college goes all the way back to 1989, where he started here as a student. And interesting enough, like, like one of my other managers, Jason, he started in the marine diving program. Now, why would the marine diving program feed all our IT directors? I'm not sure, but, um, <laughs> but Dan didn't finish in that program. He, he took courses for a while, and then he transferred to Antioch, and by uh, 97, he graduated with a, a BA in communications, and then stayed on for a couple more years at Antioch, and got his master's in organizational behavior, or management. In 2000, Dan started uh, here at the college, initially part-time working on the implementation for our new student portal at that time. Uh, and that quickly turned into a full-time position as the uh, director for, um, I guess, what do we call it at that time, Dan? Student, uh, educate, student programs. Uh, it was a, a position that he uh, worked at for about, um, well, I guess four or five years, and then he got tapped by John Romo to lead the banner implementation for our ERP, which was a big role because this was a major investment in time and money. Uh, I think John Romo felt that Dan had the, the, the skill set, the project management ability to carry that project forward, and he did. It was successful. Uh, he did that until 2008 when we decided, whoa, we need him in IT. So we made him a, the director of uh, infrastru or infrastructure and systems. We created a new position, gave him responsibility for uh, lots of stuff in IT, but part of that was still Banner, uh, which is our ERP. Um, 
Dan serves as a member of the District Technology Committee. He chairs a subgroup which, of that committee, which is the Administrative Applications Work Group. Uh, he served as the, uh, has served as lead of the Advancing Leadership Committee, and he helped develop the current management agreement with the district. Uh, some of his current projects, and I'm not going to tell you about his past ones because the list is very long, uh, but he was responsible for putting together our project management software that we use in IT for our projects. Uh, he did that about two or three years ago, and we now have over 300 active projects in that that are being managed now, and we have timelines and schedules. That's why when Dan goes to a meeting, he says, oh, you want that done? That'll be uh, two years and three months we can start that one, because he knows how many projects are in the queue. Uh, this year, he was helping finalizing getting all the Wi-Fi up in classrooms. Um, you know, we initially covered all the public areas with Wi-Fi. The, the faculty took a little longer to come on board, and finally, uh, the faculty senate resolved, yes, we do want them Wi-Fi in classrooms, and Dan this year is finishing that project. Uh, he's, this year, he chaired the room scheduling RFP uh, group. Uh, he's, been, he's been leading the, uh, the web redesign RFP process. And he led the most recent campus portal upgrade. So the guy to put the first portal in, still working on portals. I feel sorry for Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, he's organized, helped organize the last three management retreats, all of which were highly successful. The last one was great, where we went to the um, the, uh, the Museum of Tolerance. Right. <laughs> yeah. It was great, and I and I did and did enjoy that. Um, the bus ride, you know, I was, I'm still kind of <laughs> iffy on that, but, um, and last but not least, you know, he received the Outstanding Administrator of the Year Honorable Mention Award two years in a row, 2013 and 2014, and then finally in 2015, he won the uh, Administrator of the Year Award. Dan has been an outstanding asset to the college, the district, and the California Community College system. And I feel privileged to have Dan as an IT director, a colleague, and a good friend. Thank you, Dan, for 15 years of dedicated service to Santa Barbara City College. He's the next one up. That was my, my logic. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was that, a good plan. Yeah, that's why I did that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Thank you, Paul. Oh, uh, <laughs> so one of the things that I love most about this college and coming to work every day I often say it, and I truly believe it, I feel like I've won the lottery working here. Um, I think if I won the lottery, I'd probably continue to work here. In fact, I know somebody who did that, but um, <laughs> few people did that. Uh, this college, it does have something special about it, and I feel so blessed to have uh, had my career be here, and I hope it continues here for um, the future. Uh, one of the, w another thing that makes it so great is in the people that I work with, the teams that I work with, it isn't me that has done all those things that Paul said, it's been us. You know, I mean, he, the wireless project, Jerry Thomas, the portal project, Jennifer Hawk, I'm gonna talk about in honor in a second, and um, the whole team, network services, administrative systems. Going back 15 years, I've worked with incredible people. So while I've um, been able to lead some of that, it's been um, really the people that have made it the success that it is. Um, I get a little bit of the credit, but not certainly not all of it. And uh, again, couldn't have done it without an extraordinary staff. And I think that's part of what makes Santa Barbara special is we um, attract a, an extraordinary staff. And one of those staff members is also being honored for 15 years, and that's Jennifer Hott. Um, she's uh, a member of our administrative services team uh, in the IT department. Her current role is an information system specialist three, and although she doesn't like being recognized for this, it's true. She almost single-handedly supports our entire college website, 
which is over 2,300 pages, um, and the content management system that runs uh, our website. Um, so all of the work orders that have anything to do with the web or the website or web technology end up at Jen's queue, and she has to manage that. Um, and I feel uh, it's an amazing accomplishment given the complexity and the size of our organization to be able to do that. Uh, and on top of that, she supports um, the college's online application. So when students enroll, the CCC apply application, she supports that. She supports the student voting application. So when students vote at Student Senate, she does that. She's our uh, web accessibility 508 compliance person. She works with Paul in making sure all of our web content is compliant. Uh, and um, I mean, the list of the things that uh, she supports goes on, but those are some of the big ones. A uh, major project she's working on right now is with the Chancellor's Office Technology Center, um, and it's, uh, she's working with the Technology Center, Admissions and Records, and International Application to get our international application in, in CCC apply, so our, our, our international students can apply through that same process. Um, I had only been working here a few months in um, 2000, uh, when I was asked to be on a hiring committee, and I sat on the committee that actually hired Jennifer. So we were colleagues, and she was an online student support specialist at the time, and we ran together the portal in the first online college at the school. I think we had maybe 900, 500, 900 students that first fall, and it wasn't a true online system in that people would uh, sign up for courses, and then it would be a day later we'd get them enrolled. It wasn't instantaneous as it is, you know, today, but uh, so we get all the calls going, how come I'm not in this class yet? How come I'm not in this class yet? So we would kind of manage all of that, and then the online college uh, um, used a learning management system called WebCT, and so we kind of supported all of that together uh, under ed programs, under Jack's leadership. Um, so we've been here a long time doing this for a long time. I asked some of our colleagues about uh, Jen, and a couple th themes emerged from some of the stuff they said. One of it is she has a fantastic work ethic. Um, she will often, and I know CSA, close your ears, um, she will often interrupt her vacation or work at home in off hours to handle a web issue. And I mean, so she'll, she'll drop what she's doing, hopefully not her son, but she'll drop what she's doing and, and help with a, with a web issue. And that leads to, in her personal life, that dedication is apparent in that everyone has recognized what a fantastic super mom she is. And um, we all get to see her son every now and then, and, and, uh, and she's just doing a great job. So. I feel blessed to have known Jennifer and had the opportunity to work with her for 15 years, and we're lucky to have her on our team. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, if uh, Dean Allen Price would come down and uh, recognize Sharon Stewart. Okay, thank you. Well, it is a pleasure to recognize Sharon Stewart. She is a registered nurse who got her degree here at Santa Barbara City College and like many of us came back to serve in an amazing way. Mm -hmm. She has been with the college over 15 years and works as one of our team members in the Allied Health and Nursing Lab. And that is where a lot of very special learning occurs. It's very valuable learning where students are reinforcing their knowledge and skills of nursing foundations. And Sharon is instrumental in making it a very special place and an environment where students feel comfortable and enjoy coming and being there. So it's only with the commitment of the staff and that includes Sharon, that where this learning can occur. She is um, adored by colleagues, so both staff and faculty, and by students as well. She's a true gem, 
And I think the best way to get that point across is to tell you a few things that students have said about Sharon. Um, she is amazing and very helpful. This is verbatim. She is eager to help. She's attentive to our needs. She gives us positive reinforcement. She smiles. <laughs> She's available to help. She's patient. And she um, is a wonderful instructor. And I really grew under her nurturing guidance. Some people refer to her as the mother of the lab in the most positive mm -hmm. meaning. But I want to share the last comment with you that really emphasizes the relationships we all have with our students. And it's why we're here, and it's what makes City College so special. Quote, unquote, she's awesome. I want my family to come in and meet her. Aww. So thank you. We're very lucky to have you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's been um, a wonderful opportunity to work with City College this long and to start out um, having graduated in another college and then coming here and going forth with my desire in nursing and then getting the chance to come and, and work with the students um, for 21 years, I think. So I'm very pleased and, and uh, proud to accept it and to have had the wonderful chance to work at Santa Barbara City College. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Jason Walker, is Jason here? Come down and honor Ryan Alexander. Good afternoon, board members, President Beebe. Um, I want to echo something Dan had said earlier um, about the staff. Uh, our department, Academic Technology Support, we have been able to accomplish so much over the years, and it's because of the staff. It's the dedicated, skilled staff that we have in our department, and today I'm lucky enough, we actually have three. Two will be here today that I'm able to speak to. We had three people that uh, were lined up this month to be honored for 10 months, and or, I'm sorry, 10 years and 15 years. And uh, again, our department is incredible, and it's because of the staff that we have in our department. Um, it's an honor to be able to recognize uh, Ryan Alexander. Ryan Alexander has been here for 15 years. He's worked in the Digital Arts Center. Um, he has co-supported the Digital Arts Center, film production, graphic design and photography, and, and the journalism department, which comes to approximately 250 computers, both PCs and Macs and responsible for supervising the hourly staff in those labs that provide user support to the students. Um, Ryan, as Ryan's supervisor, I have found him to be an incredibly skilled technician. He's very thorough, detailed oriented. Um, he's a very effective leader. He's got a keen eye for um, identifying efficiencies. Uh, he is someone who quickly takes ownership and responsibility for implementing solutions. And uh, he's also, in our department, uh, we have three staff members that have identified as our overall technical leads for the department. And I work with them whenever we have new implementations that are coming so that we can kind of plan who will maybe take lead of certain parts of it. And Ryan is one of those technical leads in academic technology support. Some of the projects that he's implemented, um, student authentication two years ago. We've been mandated by the FCC to be able to track all users. We have currently just over 2,000 machines um, uh, district-wide that students use. Uh, about 400 of those, Ryan, um, Mac Labs, Ryan led the effort to be able to implement student authentication. Um, he also, as a result of dual summer sessions, we had to replace all of the tool sets, tool cells, uh, tool sets that we use to manage the labs because we need to be able to remotely manage. He led the effort on the Mac side implementing Casper and also standardizing the um, operating systems to El Capitan. We found some vulnerabilities in Yosemite and uh, we had to very quickly be able to standardize and get them up to a, a more current version and he led that effort very diligently. Um, and additionally, he led the Blaze Cla BlazeCast implementation. I'm sorry, I'm tongue-tied today, but uh, uh, BlazeCast is the client that we installed on all of the student machines that will alert staff and students 
of any type of disaster or emergency or what have you, and he helped lead that implementation for the MACs. He is our lead for the MAC environment and academic technology support. Um, I, too, went out to uh, some of his colleagues to get comments and feedback, and some of the statements I received, Ryan has been invaluable to this school, a colleague and a friend in every way. Another, his support and unique set of technical, administrative, and creative skills has been a foundation to the credibility and the quality of the film and media programs at Santa Barbara City College. And then also, from troubleshooting software and hardware issues to assisting with state and federal grant projects to managing tutors and students in our labs, Ryan really can do it all. And so it gives me great honor to be able to introduce Ryan Alexander. I know he's here somewhere. So Jason, were you going to do Sarah? <laughs> Just, I'm not going to let you escape. I've never seen Jason tongue-tied before. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you again. And again, it's with great honor that I get to introduce Sarah Whipple. Um, Sarah Whipple has been with the college for 15 years. Um, she provides uh, support to the, lab, the business division labs, which is used by the accounting, business, communications, computer applications, and computer information systems. She single-handedly supports all of those computers, and there are roughly 150 machines. Um, Sarah also um, possesses a very high skill set, especially when it comes to um, network configurations, complex software configurations, and uh, network troubleshooting. Um, she works uh, very hard to increase her skill set and knowledge um, by any means possible, including now she is currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in technology at Cal State University Channel Islands. Um, and she's also a very effective leader. She has a great deal of experience supervising, hiring, training, and supervising hourly staff that uh, support those computer labs, five and all. Um, some of the projects that she has uh, led for our department, the relocation of the employee university, from a remote location to the Wake Center, Wake Room 5. Uh, worked with network services to troubleshoot and reconfigure the BC building uh, wiring closets. We were having a lot of issues with being able to push data across the network into those labs, and so she, as a liaison for our department, worked with network services to help get those problems resolved. Uh, she, while we were implementing new infrastructures, um, again, to mitigate the challenges of dual summer session, she stepped forward and she spent a quite a bit of time helping reconfigure what we call network group policy objects, things that we use to control settings, permissions. Uh, very complex, very, very uh, complicated. And uh, she does an incredible job. Um, additionally, she also, you'll remember, not too far in the distant past, we had to reconvert one of the labs, BC302, to a traditional classroom. And uh, she, as the technical lead, really took that project off my hands and uh, very effectively managed that project. Um, very thankful for uh, Sarah Whipple. Uh, I also put out uh, a request for feedback, and uh, two particular people sent me a lot of very good information. And so the first from Al Vera Graziano. Regarding Sarah's recognition, please know that throughout the years, Sarah has been there for our accounting education department. Personally, I can add that every time there has been an issue, Sarah, in no time at all, comes personally to our floor in the BC building and takes care of the problem. She always, over many, many years, been nice, very polite, understanding, and solve problems on the spot. And then Esther Frankel, who I think is present here today, is the faculty lab coordinator. In each of the area for a lab, we have a faculty lab coordinator. And they, we work with them to help meet the needs of the department. Sarah and um, Esther have been working for many, many years together to meet the needs of those labs. And Esther um, said that uh, one of the things that I admire most about Sarah is her willingness to continue her education and cons constantly improve herself. She has been a great model for the student interns in our lab, and she isn't afraid to implement the most complex of configurations. And for those of you that know um, Esther Frankel, um, being a technical whiz and computer savvy herself, that's really going a long ways. 
Um, so again, with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Sarah Whipple. All right, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Paul Jarrell, um, would you kindly come down and introduce Alice Perez? So, you know, it's when uh, I won't lose the irony on the fact that the, the short timer is introducing the long timer here, but um, <laughs> you know how lucky are we, Dr. Beebe, the, you know, it's people that make an institution and to get to hear these stories. I haven't met uh, many of the people that were recognized, so I'm not surprised that we have such great people because I, I knew coming in we had a great institution, but you never know until you really meet the people, so, so that's been, been great. And, and one of them that I feel very fortunate is, is Alice Perez. Um, you know, we could, could list, you know, the, she provides leadership as a, a dean to uh, uh, programs in the humanities and the arts, social sciences, English and English skills. Uh, has been instrumental in um, providing leadership to many of the programs that uh, our institution has that uh, really target on trying to move the needle on closing achievement gaps and, and moving uh, success to transfer and program completion. So. She's been done a great job in doing that, and, and I feel very fortunate to have her part of the team. I, I didn't have a lot of personal to draw on, so I certainly uh, reached out to some of uh, uh, my colleagues and her colleagues to, to kind of get some, some, some sense of, of what the broad sentiment was about uh, Alice, and, and I just wanted to share a little bit of that because I think it sheds light on really who she is. Uh, while it is true that we can list the things that she has done, everything that people commented on was really about her quality and her character. And I think that that's really quite admirable. So, so I wanna share a little bit of that. Um, one of the deans um, uh, shares a birthday with Alice. Um, and, and I have to agree with him that yes, she's the better looking one of the two of them. Uh, he, that would be Ben. That would be Ben. So you all know that yes, he tells the truth. Um, uh, you know, characteristics as, as being ultra special and, and, and not to say those things lightly. W words like mutual respect, I think those are, are really important. She, she has shown that. Uh, other words that, and phrases that came up, thoughtfulness, trusting, heartfelt, sharp intellect. Uh, I have to pause on that one for a second. I'm glad that I'm not the only one that, was going, that felt this because I was going to say it. When Phyllis, my assistant, schedules meetings with, with Alice, I always make her hold a half an hour after that so I can look up about every other word in the dictionary. <laughs> um, I'm growing. Uh, my vocabulary is growing, so thank you personally for that. And uh, I wasn't the only one that said that, so thank goodness it's not just me. Um, uh, welcoming, loving. Uh, uh, one, one individual... Uh, was really uh, felt that, that she didn't know this, but she is a, quite a mentor to him and a role model that he hopes that he can aspire to. Um, caring, namaste, uh, willingness, kind heart, gentle soul, friend, sister, uh, empathetic heart, strong supporter, leader. Um, you know, those are all the characteristics that I'm not surprised good people will give us good programs and, 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 and the institution is, is better for that. Mm -hmm. I, I shared with Alice, I, I was nervous to, to tell her this, but I felt compelled because I, I like to be honest and open with people. We were meeting in a meeting and I just, she walked in and, and, and I just felt from, I think this was after we had gone to the Museum of Tolerance and, and I felt like being open and sharing and, you know, she's just a beautiful <laughs> person. I can't think of... Uh, a single word that describes it better than that. So, she is. <laughs> thank you, everyone. That's very overwhelming, I just have to say. I, there's some people I really need to thank. 
you know, our roles here often re require such a degree of assistance. And uh, Sariana Fry assists in our office. She's an extraordinary leader in her own right. And prior to Sariana um, coming into the office with me, Phyllis Johnson, who now works with Paul, was my assistant for over five years. And really, from the bottom of my heart, without them, uh, there's no dean's office, and they completely run the show as is right and fit. They are the real deal, so I'm so grateful. I, we are part of such a stunning enterprise here. It's stunning what we are able to achieve together at this college. And it's the most noble profession, right? We all know that. Education is, is the most noble, so we should all feel so graced about that. I have to call out my dean colleagues, Ben Partee, who, who um, he's absolutely right, I'm the better looking of, of the two. <laughs> <laughs> we're, born, we're born the same day, the same year, uh, so that's pretty fun. Um, Marilyn Spaventa, if I, I went to a job fair uh, 10 years ago or 11 years ago in Southern California, and I met Marilyn, and I imprinted on her, and I've followed her like a little duckling chick <laughs> ever since she just she just really uh, helped me um, encouraged me to apply for this position and thank God that she did all my dean colleagues my the beautiful VPs at the college Pat English Jack all the years that we shared when you were my supervisor and the EVP I'm so grateful for your mentorship and your leadership thank you all much love mm -hmm. I don't see Ben Partee here. Is he? Is he in the audience? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Janet Garnett. Oh, okay, so if Janet could come down and uh, uh, honor Darren Phillips, that would be fantastic. Good afternoon, thanks for this opportunity. Um, my name's Jana, I'm the Director of Disability Services here on the campus, and I'm, I'm really here to recognize Darren Phillips for 10 years of service. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Darren because he's an exceptional employee, colleague, and that's because he's an exceptional person. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what Darren's job is here, and I think you'll agree with me, you'll get a sense of who he is as a person, and his longevity speaks volumes as well. Um, as Darren and I left the office today to come to the board meeting, I noticed he had 32 requests on his desk, and those requests were for adaptive furniture. And it's sort of the invisible role that Darren plays here on the campus um, that demonstrates his lack of ego and his student-centeredness, but he invisibly, behind the scenes, in the early mornings, and the cracks within the schedule, he sneaks into classrooms and he places furniture for students with disabilities. Those students either have physical limitations, mobility impairments, medical conditions, and it sounds relatively small that someone would spend their day placing furniture in classrooms, but um, our students will attest to what a difference that makes. It's, it's a difference between success and failure when they can focus on the instruction instead of their limitations. Um, the other thing Darren does is he hires and trains our tram drivers, and Though that particular service is also there for students with disabilities, whether they're permanent or temporary. Um, as you can imagine, this campus is sometimes hard to traverse when you have a limitation. So another sort of invisible role that makes a world of difference for our students. Um, Darren is also an active member of our BIT team, which is our behavior intervention team. And we meet weekly and we receive reports of students of concern, and I, I really emphasize the word, uh, word concern. Um, we take a look, we evaluate those reports, and we try to identify appropriate interventions and referrals to campus-wide resources, and it makes a difference for our students. Um, Darren is, I talked about the invisible side, but he is also the face of our department. He's all about relationships, trust building. Um, he's institutional memory. People find us because Darren is part of our department. He is truly the anchor, and um, I can't imagine our department without him. So thank you, Darren. Darren Phillips.
Phillips. I just want to say what I'm, what such a pleasure to work for this institution. I did a lot of my school, all my school and higher education in England, and I knew that was going to be fun, going to be a student. But I never thought it'd be this much fun and this fulfilling to work in higher education over here. And I wake up every day with a full heart knowing I'm going to work at the best department on campus. Mm -hmm. And so I want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank, thank everyone for their service. Uh, they got the awards here tonight. I mean, I think it's, it's really a testament to the quality of individuals that we have and a really phenomenal place to work. I'd like to echo that because I just think it's extraordinary. We heard about eight of 13 people we're honoring today and a collective service time of 210 years with this college. Um, our people are our resources, our wealth, and every one of you directly or indirectly supporting our students, and we thank you for that. And it's wonderful to hear uh, so many folks talking about how they love this job. Well, we're really happy about that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that concludes our report. Okay, so that concludes our uh, recognitions for today. <laughs> Something I said. Uh, so I think we, well. we're seeing a lack of interest in the business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something I said, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> My comment wasn't fair. I, I think they put in a hard day's work already. Yeah. It's nice they wanted to come, though. You know, they didn't have to, so that was nice. Oh, the well, we still have an audience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we understand if some of you don't want to sit through the whole meeting. But we are now going to approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of July 14th and the special meeting of August 1, 2016. I think we could take them together. So I have a motion to approve. Craig, Move. second. Second. Peter, second. Any comments? Yeah, there we go. Um, I, it was just, I think, because it's a template, and or maybe not, Andrew, you can fix it, but I think it was Dr. Beebe's report, and I think it said... Yeah, you fix. I knew you would because you're Bought on that. it. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I didn't mean it. Yeah. Okay. Not that I could do your job. No. <laughs> okay. With that amendment, um, can we approve the minutes? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. And now we have the report from Academic Senate. Priscilla, welcome. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Beebe. Um, so you, I'm sure, have noticed it's the first week of classes. <laughs> and so it was so nice to see the recognitions of the people who've worked here for a long while. Um, and it's nice to see everybody back this week. And of course, the faculty came back last week. Um, so in S uh, Senate news, we had our academic Senate retreat on August 17th, Wednesday of last week. And at the retreat, we're able, able to delve more deeply into topics that we wouldn't normally be able to talk about for three or four hours at a stretch. So that was very nice. Um, three of the things that we did spend a lot more time on are discussions of our student equity efforts. Uh, I had mentioned in previous report to the board um, discussion about the possibility of developing a faculty mentoring program for students. And the third major topic was about the evaluation of two summer sessions. So those topics, of course, will carry forward through the year. And our next meeting is going to be on August 31st. But uh, we also give an address at the faculty in service. And so um, I was updating the faculty about some of the things that are new for this year and the major efforts. And I'm sure you've heard about these a few times before. Um, uh, the, integration of Canvas, which will replace Moodle in the coming year. We have a transition year this year. Um, Starfish replaces our on-track grades first program, which, which is a system to uh, send updates to students about how they're doing in the class, progress checks, et cetera. Um, we 
our, uh, we have a pilot project with open educational resources where some of our faculty have committed to using um, what are OERs for short, they're free textbooks that students can uh, use in their classrooms. And of course, we've, we've all heard quite a few times and very happily about SBCC Promise and the faculty were so pleased to know about the participation rates of our students, which is really phenomenal. Uh, thank you, Jeff, is he still here? Okay, um, and then uh, again, talking about faculty mentoring, and it was great because um, we have a new co-director of the FRC, the Faculty Resource Center, and um, uh, Elizabeth came up to me after and said, I've done a lot of research on this, let's get together. So I'm really excited that the Senate and the FRC will be able to partner in looking at that further. Um, another big topic that we wanted to start faculty thinking about is something I think that the, the board, the administration, the college as a whole is thinking about together and that's what is our vision, how do we see the future of the college. So the faculty have started that conversation as well. And um, what I see most immediately and is of great concern, this is my last point, um, about what Senate is concerned about talking about is the evaluation of two summer sessions. So uh, as you know, we've done this experiment for two summers in a row and we're very interested in really analyzing how it has worked for us. Um, so the Senate is scheduled to discuss that again at our August 31st, September 14th meetings and then make a recommendation related to that at our September 28th meeting and that will correspond with the discussion around the academic calendar for the coming year. So I expect I'll be talking about that again with you. Okay, thank you. Any questions, anyone? Okay. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, Dylan, report of uh, Student Senate. Good afternoon, uh, President Croninger, President Beebe, and members of the board. My name is Dylan Raymond, and I am the president of the Associate Students this school year. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the students. When I ran for my position, I gave students my vision for a college that wasn't just a means to an end, not just a stop on the way to students' destination. I imagined a school where there is a strong sense of community and compassion, of inclusion and belonging. That's the SBCC that I promised to help build. After I was elected, I began to diligently work on making my promise a reality. During the summer months, the ASG's planning committee met almost a dozen times to get a head start on our affairs so that we could hit the ground running this year. And I am pleased to say that the student government has, so far, had a fantastic start. We have completed a significant rework and reconstruction of the student association's bylaws which, in addition to our budget this year, is expected to be approved tomorrow morning at our first Student Senate meeting. We have begun coordinating with the Academic Senate, which we consider as one of our most important allies as we work on initiatives this year. And most critically, we have commenced a rigorous and extensive search for the best students we can find to join our student government this year. As of today, we only have six out of 18 seats filled on our student government. However, uh, instead of seeing this as an obstacle, we see this as an incredible opportunity. Um, one of my favorite quote, quotes, uh, Teddy Roosevelt said, the best executive is the one who has enough sense to pick the best men he can find and enough self-restraint to step back and allow them to do their jobs. That's exactly what I intend to do. My, officer, my officers and I have the rare opportunity to design and build our own team of passionate and hardworking students and um, th and they want to truly uh, affect positive change on campus. Uh, we are looking for the best of the best, and we are looking for students with intrinsically diverse passions, majors, and backgrounds. With this richer variety of perspectives at the table, we hope to be able to innovate our organization in exciting new ways. We are especially focused on recruiting freshmen. Uh, one of the greatest challenges facing our organization, in my opinion, is a lack of institutional memory. Most senators and officers join the ASG their second or third year at City College. By focusing on freshmen, we hope to find students who will remain in the associate student government for several, for several years, passing on their experience to future newcomers. In addition to recruitment, we are reinforcing our commitment to accountability. 
This semester, all of the ASG's reports, expenditures, and receipts will be fully documented and made available to the public on an online database. The year has just started, and there are so many opportunities going forward. I'm excited to get to work. Thank you. Questions, anyone? Well, thank you, Dylan. I really appreciate hearing about your vision and your thoughtful um, approach to, to uh, looking forward for this year. Thank you so much. Liz, classified employees. Good afternoon, Madam President, Mr. President, Dr. President, I should say, <laughs> members of the board. Uh, classified staff have been working hard uh, making sure everything has got ready for school and summer session, two of them. So we haven't been meeting for the summer, neither CSCA or the classified consultation group, so I don't have anything really to report on that. We are doing an evaluation of the, summer, the, the two summer sessions, which uh, I'm in the process of evaluating now. I did want to know, make a couple comments on the SERP. CSCA did not ask to negotiate the SERP, but we do support it completely. Uh, and so we, we signed off on it. We think it is a very good plan. If it does go through, though, we will ask to negotiate the impacts and the effects of it, because if a lot of people retire, there may be uh, a lot of impacts and effects. So we will ask to negotiate that, but we are supportive of it. A lot of staff have talked to me about it, so uh, hopefully it will go through. Questions? Thank you, Liz. And. Um, now a report from our president and superintendent. I just wanted to make a few comments about the beginning of the semester activities. We started off with a Vaccaro welcome, which was uh, something that Dr. Gaskin started, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful tradition. Um, about 20 of us geared up in our uh, academic regalia and uh, greeted about, I think it was about 800 students and parents. Um, it was just a huge, huge uh, a group of folks there. And our goal was, in 30 minutes, these 20 people um, were to give these students some college success tips. And um, they were all over the place, but they were each and every one very, very valuable in terms of helping students understand some of the hurdles that they'll have in front of them and just to get organized and that kind of thing. So that was, that was really great. And I hope it's a tradition that we will continue because I, I thought it was really, really fantastic. Um, then on Thursday, we had the all-campus kickoff, and uh, that was, was really highlighted um, by several sessions that we had, and I was so proud to have um, Dr. Hasland introduce me to the college, and I want to thank you for that. You did just an excellent job. Um, I was able to spend a few minutes talking about my vision, about the, the fiscal um, uh, kind of affair that we're in right now with the college um, and then also my goals and and then uh, we had um, some discussion about the SERP and and Joe did an excellent job of explaining some some aspects of that we had introductions of faculty classified and new managers which was really nice and then the rest of the day was filled with all kinds of workshops I think it was over 30 workshops and I really need to call out um, Kenley Newfield in terms of and, and the whole professional development committee for putting all of those together. It's a tremendous amount of work, and uh, those, those workshops were just fantastic. I just heard all kinds of buzz about the different workshops that we had. And then Friday was devoted to the, to the programs, the academic programs and uh, department <coughs> meetings, and it was really, uh, really excellent in terms of what they were, were doing and working on. And so that's, that's really the end of my report. I mean, really high spirit, and I'm really proud of uh, what I witnessed this, this, the beginning of the semester. Well, thank you. Um, now it's time for board reports. I know we had a facilities committee meeting. Yes, we had a facilities committee meeting. It was 16 minutes long, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything is on the agenda. I recommend we pass it all. Um, just to give you a highlight, there was an issue with the rust in the bookstore building that we had to allocate a couple extra thousand dollars to to fix, but it's saving money in the long term because it's a it was a problem. Um, but that that was the main thing that I thought was relevant to bring up. Okay. Uh, anyone else have uh, reports? 
I wanted to mention, um, now that we're back to classes, uh, there were a few more activities. Several of us were able to attend the kickoff, and I certainly enjoyed it as well. Anthony, I think that it was a, a great event, and appreciate Kenley and the committee that put it together. Um, also, I got to attend the faculty awards reception, which was a wonderful event. Um, really great to hear about um, the awards that our faculty have received or been nominated for and the work that they are doing. Um, there's such a diversity and so many wonderful people. And it's nice to hear them recognized there as well as here. Um, and then also the, this is all last week, uh, Express to Success Orientation Program. I went to that and got a chance to meet some of our students who were um, joining in that program, some of whom who had been through it once and were moving on to a different subject and others who were there for the first time and then listened to the folks who were giving that orientation. So that was fun too, so. Um, our next step here is the review of the 1617 adopted budget and this is the first time we're looking at it. Next time would be the actual formal adoption of this budget. So uh, if folks have questions, um, this is a good time to ask. So Lindsay Moss will lead this uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. She's been working diligently on it, I know, just about every day if not every day, and uh, she's really done a masterful job of pulling this all together, and I think you're going to be impressed. Thank you, President. And uh, good evening now, Board of Trustees. <clears throat> I was all geared up for this presentation ready, and then all this excitement with all the awards, you know, so now everybody's gone because no one wants to listen to this because it's boring. <laughs> um, I've been feeling guilty the last few presentations. It's like, how can I make this more exciting? I was thinking about coming with like a hat or like doing a dance during it. And then I hand this to you as a, as a handout because I've just completed the presentation and you probably look at it and say, oh my goodness, there's 41 pages. I'm not gonna go through 41 pages. That's my good news for you. I'm just going through the first, first section which is about 16 pages. The rest of it is, is backup, additional details. Um, I am gonna have a, a, a different flow to this presentation than I've done in the past, as is uh, with everything. We're, we're doing new things, do new changes, presenting things to the board at different times, at different meetings. Um, and I'll explain why as I get into it, but there's, there's some, some different slides you've never seen before just to try and make this make a little more sense. Because as I worked through the numbers, I just felt like, wow, if they don't, if they don't see these extra details, it doesn't make any sense. So that's the fun of the, the fun of the budget numbers. So I'm really just gonna focus on the changes from tentative to the adopted budget. We're gonna look a little bit at 1516, fund balances, and then as I said, all those adopted budget details that are in there after slide 18 are the usual slides that you've seen at the tentative budget time, but they're all updated with actual, unaudited actuals from 1516 and the adopted budget figures, just to provide some, some more details. But we're gonna, we'll, we can go through those at fiscal if we want next week, because we are gonna review uh, this again at fiscal on September 6th, okay? Okay, so changes from tentative to adopted. We're gonna start with the revenues. It's very, very simple. Uh, only two changes to the revenues. <clears throat> We talked about this last time I was up here a couple weeks ago. We have the decrease of the non-resident fees, revenues of 592,000. The other item is related to this accounting change I mentioned last time. The revenues related to the School of Culinary Arts venues, those revenues needed to be removed because they're being taken out of the general fund and moved over to a special revenue fund. So just an accounting change, but it does, does make the numbers change up here. So the total revenues for the unrestricted general fund will decrease 978,000 from the tentative budget to the adopted budget, okay? That's all that impacts the unrestricted general fund. I do have a note up there that during the um, <clears throat> last set of information we received from the state, the deferred maintenance and instructional equipment funding one-time revenues did decline from 2.6 million down to 2.1 million. 
So those revenues go straight into our construction and equipment funds. They don't touch our unrestricted general funds, but you will see that reduction as you dig into the details on the construction tab and on the equipment uh, tab, okay? So Lindsay, yep, just to go make ahead. sure I'm understanding it. Um, in terms of revenue, the real increase or decrease is the 592, 182. Yep. And culinary is just moving. Yep, that's right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is that same information again, just uh, numerically, so you can see those values and how it looks in our budget. Um, I have this for both the revenues and expenditures. Same thing here, I'm actually, on this one, I'm gonna skip to the next slide, because I think it's easier to see these in, the, uh, in this format here. So on the expense side, we did have a handful of changes between tentative and adopted budget on the expense side, just we're talking again, unrestricted general fund, and that was just because we've been really working through this new, new budgeting tool we have, and um, really refining things at the last minute what we've done with that first number, that academic salaries reduced to account for the vacant positions not being filled in 1617. We just communicated with HR and found out who exactly are we hiring and what positions shouldn't be in the budget. Historically, we just didn't do that at this, at this stage, really trying to get these numbers to be refined and as accurate as possible. So that accounted for a reduction in our expenditures of $886,000. So, that was, that was good news. Um, those positions just won't be filled this year, and they were built into the tentative budget. So there's a big change there, which luckily offsets that $879,000 increase in the employee benefits, which we did allude to a little bit in the last meeting. Um, I'll jump to that. So I did detail out the variances at, at a summary level of where all those impacts are hitting. Each of those sections stirs per Social Security, Medicare, health benefits, unemployment, workers' comp. Those are all the employee benefits that fall under that, that large number of 879,000. Most of it's falling under health benefits. And the reason for that increase was also adjustments to our system to fine tune the um, benefits that some employees were budgeted to have, single versus family, waiver versus family, et cetera. Um, the other adjustments are, are smaller, um, so I don't, unless you have questions about them, I don't plan on going into detail with, about them. And then same with classified salaries went up a little bit just as we fine tune the figures. And then you see that culinary arts revenue expenditures coming out again. Uh, so it came out on both sides, revenue and expense. And that's just a movement over to a different fund. Any questions about those? No, okay. This is going to be quick and easy and exciting, I know. <laughs> uh, transfers, there's just one minor adjustment I made on the transfers from tentative to adopted. Um, we have always transferred from the general fund to the construction fund enough money to cover the loan payments for our two energy loans. And this year I caught that we've been transferring the full amount, but we only needed to be transferring the interest only portion of it because that's the actual amount that the construction fund pays every year. So good news, uh, it's just a reduction of $228,000 down to the $54,000 amount. No other changes are made to the transfers, okay? And this is what that looks like, all those uh, tr um, adjustments I just mentioned. You see, does this have a pointer on it? I think it does, all right. You see that $978,000 reduction in revenues from tentative to adopted, the grand total of 114,000 in expenditures that have gone down from tentative to adopted, and transfers, just that minor change there. And the big numbers that we always wanna focus on here, down at the bottom, the excess of revenues or expenditures, the tentative budget we were planning on having a deficit budget of 1.6 million, and now with the adopted budget, we have a deficit of 2.2 million. Okay. Can I ask? Yep. Um, under 1516, unaudited actual. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we continue to work with those numbers, and yeah. my question is in a very big picture, ballpark kind of way, do you have a sense of whether that number will be changing or by how much? I know it will be changing. It's already changed from here, about 100 grand uh, 
additional expenses. I don't know exactly how much more it's going to change. We're just right in the middle of closing our books. Okay, I'm just trying to get a feel yeah, for are we talking 100,000 or a couple million? I wouldn't say a couple million. That would be that would be excessive. But yeah, we're just finishing up our usual year-end journal entries, reviewing our liabilities. I wouldn't expect anything that major. Okay. But but we'll know soon. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mhm. Mm Hundreds of thousands, I mean, would be Oh, maybe a hundred thousand or something probably more likely probably I hate to say because yeah, when yeah, we yeah. do bad debt expense that one fluctuates year to the year but usually it's not not anything amazing yeah I'm just looking yeah. for the mouse or elephant sort of thing yeah <laughs> nothing giant okay yeah, yeah. just a uh, you'll notice everywhere in the presentation I have that these 15 16 numbers are not final because they're just not I don't want anyone to no, look I, in six I, months and go whoa why are these all different okay. so that's why we have that there Okay, we're gonna keep going. And this is the section that we've never really done before, but in this situation, I felt like it was very important to take a quick peek at last year at 1516. And you're gonna see why as I get into this. So 1516, just to start with the revenues, our revenues, um, <clears throat> sorry, we have adopted budget, adjusted budget, and unaudited actual. So this is a little different than what you're used to seeing. You're used to seeing multiple years up here. So just, just to point that out, you're seeing all the same year. Our adopted budget throughout the year, the board approves our budget adjustments. And then we have where we're falling so far with the actuals. So revenues are higher. That's great news. Um, I do have some notes for everyone of what that's kind of made up of uh, just high level. So. We have our fun with the uh, revenues, with the prior year recalcs, the revenues we're never expecting, but we're always happy to get. We have the recalc is about 500,000, that first line is prior year re recalc. <clears throat> also some additional lottery money than, than budgeted, and a little bit less in apportionment, but it all nets out to this 461. And then on the local side, that's primarily made up of non-resident uh, tuition being higher than budgeted offset by enrollment being down, and another increase from the RDA dissolution proceeds being higher than we budgeted. Those are very hard to estimate. So that's where that one's coming from. Okay, on the expenditure side, we're 2.7 less than our budget. Also, good news, better than the wrong direction. So what we're seeing here on the academic salaries is our decline in enrollment is contributing to our, our academic salaries being lower. Um, in line with that is the employee benefits. Those sort of go together. And then classified salaries. Uh, we did go uh, spend a little more than projected on hourly, but we spent a little less on classified positions, probably vacant positions that weren't filled. Okay, just real quick here. I don't want to spend too much time. Um, supplies was purely supplies we came in under budget. There's nothing there aren't a lot of uh, items under supplies. It's mostly instructional supplies. Other operating is a whole host of different items. Uh, a lot of items in that area we budget for, and, um, <clears throat> and we just don't know until the year is completely over where those are going to fall. Those are the numbers that are going to change. That's where we do some year-end adjustments. Um, but that's made up of contracts, consultants, a number of areas that uh, were under budget. And these other are, are real small. So we have this revenues being two million higher, expenditures being 2.7 lower. What that has resulted in is down here, where I always like to talk again, is our ending fund balance. That meant that instead of having our adopted budget deficit of 7.5 million that did throughout the year get better to 6.9, we're landing more around 2 million. So that means we have 4.8, almost 5 million more following the ending fund balance than we had pr planned. And why I'm, I'm pointing this out, we're, we're gonna get there. That's very important because it's very different than what you've seen in the tentative budget, okay? Here we go. Just to point this out in a little different format. Again, be careful because I've never shown it this way where it's the same year next to the same year, but your ending fund balance is here we were looking at having an undesignated amount of about 3.8 above the board policy reserve amount, and now it's, it's in the $9 million range. So much, much higher, this 28.5% instead of 25.5, okay? 
So I'm going to keep going. Now I'm going to jump us into our 1617 audited budget, specifically the fund balances, because this is the main part that's really changed from tentative to adopted, not so much because of the changes in tentative to adopted, but because of what's happened with 1516. Does that make sense with the ending fund balances? Okay. So again, we've got, now we're, we're seeing our more typical format where we have 14, 15, 15, 16, and then 16, 17 adopted budget. We have 6.6 .6 million as our undesignated fund balance. That's the amount that's above our 21.5 board policy amount. So about 7% over our board policy minimum. So I just always like to point out where we're, where we're at with our fund balances. And then we have our favorite slide we all like to look at. Although I have to admit my line didn't get moved down. That should be down at the 20.5. I will fix that for next week. Um, so here's what our ending fund balances are looking like for the adopted budget. And keep in mind these two big green bars, that's our construction fund that contains the campus center replacement and the swing space fund balances. So that's why those are so large. Any questions about that? If I'm just good news. About, yeah, it's good news. Very good news. I know. It's always fun to present good news, yes. not yeah. bad news. Very nice. <laughs> and good presentation because oh, it's making it clear how we're moving through with the numbers. Yeah. And that's really all I have. The rest of it, like I said, is, is back up for, um, you know, for further discussion if necessary or just for our information. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there something about a dance? Yes. Would you like me to do the dance now, Peter? I'm not a good dancer. Happy dance? That, that's why I do numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make one quick comment that has to do with the banner conversion. You know, um, as we get more and more experienced with banner and running the, the, the budgets like this, it's going to get more and more accurate. And, you know, so I, I feel really encouraged about that because all the hours that, that everybody's spending on learning banner is really paying off in, in the long run. And I think that you're going to be happy with the accuracy of, of what we're, we're seeing. Yes. I just want to say that we had standing ovation recognition, and I want to say thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have a family, and I have gotten the pleasure to work with you over the last few years, and you put in a lot of time and effort, and you have a lot of integrity in your work, and so you just keep stepping up. Thank you. So I want to say thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to say our banner expert is sitting out there, James. He's put a lot of effort into this, and uh, without him, I'd be at a complete loss, as he's very technical, very helpful. So I appreciate James and my whole team for helping me put it together. So as oh. Dan and many others said, I don't do it by myself. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks you, Thanks very much. Thank you. And to James. This may be the first time I would ever suggest bringing a cake in celebration <laughs> <laughs> at the fiscal committee. This is really Okay, good plan. <laughs> Okay, our next agenda item is the Board of Trustee Goals, and I think Anthony may have some comments, but I just wanted to kind of set a big picture view, which is I think we had the opportunity to spend a considerable amount of time together, both in April and more recently, working on our ideas about our priorities and leading up to the goals, and also working with our new superintendent president on the goals that he has in mind so that we come together as a team and take a common view of where we're headed um, as we look to this next year. So Anthony, do you have any particular comments? Well, I was, in terms of the retreat and you know, all of our work together, I just felt really good about um, kind of the direction that we're, he we're headed with, with your goals and uh, my goals that are complementary to what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So, yeah, it's all good. Okay. So there is in your handout a draft which was intended to reflect uh, our discussions. And um, <coughs> the question is, uh, I guess the process would be whether we should make a motion to adopt and then discuss any changes. Um, so let's go with that direction. And then, uh, so if we have a motion to adopt, Peter? I will move to adopt. Jonathan second, and now 
discussion, comments, changes? Anybody? Jonathan? Yeah, I just want to say that I'm very happy that uh, we kept in the support continued efforts to diversify our employees. That uh, mm -hmm. means a lot to me. I think that's something we really need to work on. So I'm glad that's in there. Well, it was a comment I think you brought up at our last yeah. meeting, and it yeah. was really uh, a very insightful comment um, because there is a combination here. If the SERP goes ahead, then we have an opportunity to work on that goal more than we ordinarily would. So, uh, anybody else? Emily. So I was looking over this, and um, underneath the student access and success, I think um, with the recent changes going on around the um, SBCC and the student body, I think that it might be time. My recommendation for the board would be to put um, maybe underneath student access and success, uh, maybe some wording around student housing of some sorts. Um, not sure exactly how to word what I would um, want specifically there, but I think um, it is time to um, take the next steps in realizing and recognizing that um, the struggle with finding student housing and um, how much that struggle really does affect our students' access and success to this institution. Uh, so I think that for the um, academic goals this year that it is, um, it's my recommendation that we put some sort of um, reference to student housing. Yeah, um, we did have uh, in, in item four down here the last bullet point, and we do have some typo issues, which I'm sure are my fault, mm -hmm. um, where we've got double dots. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the last one, we're talking about um, engaging, participating, supporting, and engaging at the policy level with our superintendent president and the college to address major issues that will guide the college going forward, including college vision, scaling the size of the college, and related housing issues, and fiscal stability. And the thinking behind that is that these are interrelated. I mean, we touched earlier this morning that, or this afternoon, <laughs> evening, um, that uh, it's a complex issue. Housing is not a standalone issue. It is something that greatly affects our community, our con community relationships. Craig mentioned this. Um, so I'm thinking of it as a more gl global goal. Mm -hmm. And hence the recognition or the placing of scaling together with housing so that we talk about it in a global way. Um, <coughs> so that's kind of the thinking. And, and I have been talking with, with Dr. Beebe about um, one of the remaining items, which is student housing on our list of to get to things this year, uh, on next steps. So I'm hoping we're going to have some next steps that we'll work something through for our agenda next time that will move in that direction. Um, other comments? Peter. Well, the other area that, that, that seems obvious to me is the fourth bullet under item one, student access and success, where we talk about um, student ed, uh, educational access because housing appears to be very much related to the question of access. We could put an exploratory goal there, that we, the, we commit ourselves to explore uh, the, the, the feasibility of student housing of whatever stripe we come up with. But I, I, I agree that this is, this is really an important point. Mm -hmm. this, our, student, our student body has a right to know that we really are serious, we're gonna look at it. The community has an equal right in knowing that we're gonna look at it carefully from all perspectives. So uh, I, I would support the idea that we throw something in here that says student mm -hmm. housing. Yeah, I, I think it, all I'm saying is I think we do wanna do that. I'm, I'm just, you know, where it goes, I don't care. Um, it's just that I don't wanna trip over ourselves in how we express right. it. They're the same but thing. The, the three yeah. student speakers yeah. that we've had ha have each said something about the, the difficulty uh, that is imposed on them as, as learners because of the absence of proximity housing, housing that's close enough to campus so that, that these burdens don't become 
a negative impact on their ability to learn. And that, to Correct. me, that has to do with student access. It does, but it also has to do with the whole question of the nature of our student body, which is part of that larger discussion, which is scaling the college and, and the composition, mm -hmm. which we talked about in our, um, no, when no, Paul I, presented. I, so, I agree yeah. completely. So, um, goal attainment, again, I'm just looking, because this is a focus on local needs, um, the fourth bullet point. And I think you're talking about the needs of people who are coming from, I mean, our speakers were from out of state. No. Um, from Monterey and from Pennsylvania. As far as I recall. And maybe one from within state but out of district. Yes. Are we really looking for to finalize some wording for this at this time? Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. we can do. I, mm -hmm. I yes, this I is for I final adoption. Thank you. Then I would. Um, then I would like to see um, a phrase in there that says, you know, that we should look at housing issues related to specifically, you know, uh, student throughput, student success. Mm -hmm. That I think that that one bullet point added, so we're looking at housing and how it would would and could affect okay. student throughput, which okay. I think what you've all been saying. I no, just try to that. find exact words. Veronica, you were also I think that again. making that a goal is getting us a little bit ahead where we've been, certainly with Dr. Gaskin, is listening to the community, working with the MESA. It's been at steps. And I think that that may be something that will come as a result of Dr. If we have a goal for the community to support the superintendent president to create this communication with the community as I think Dr. Beebe is out there because this issue, so my heart goes out to an employee that has to drive from Ventura and is working here at our college. Um, our heart goes out to our foster youth. Our heart goes out to our single parents. Um, so I think that the city in itself, I mean, our local elementary school has declining enrollment. Families are leaving the area. So this issue in Santa Barbara is a huge issue, I think, for our whole city. And it's one that the college can lead once we listen to our partners, the housing authority, the city, and there's so many different stakeholders that are invested in this topic, um, that I think that if we leave that to continue the conversation within the community focus, then I wouldn't feel comfortable putting an objective, something very specific as to what exactly we want to happen. I would want something more broad to yield to Dr. Beebe for him to then shape and mold that as he sees fit. And I think that mm -hmm. that's the direction we should go. I think we uh, already have that, right? Uh, Jonathan and then Marianne. I think what Craig and Peter mentioned was broad enough to be a, a board level decision, which is to explore and to engage with the community, not I don't think we should take a stance like we shouldn't look into housing in this specific way, but I think housing is an issue, and I think we do need to specifically mention student housing and workforce housing. They're both issues that uh, our college struggles with, but um, I think we need to mention it specifically to show people that this is something we're taking seriously, not we're going to allude to it. I think related housing issues is not maybe a strong enough statement for me. So then maybe we say something to housing, but I want to want to limit it to students. Right. No. Because so let's, let's do both. Or because all we have so many student populations that, and I, I remember one time we were talking when we were talking about the mission. We we're like, wait, can we be all things to all people? And so we really have to look at also the scope of our work and our capacity. And so I think that if you're, we're going to look at housing, then to reach the broad mission, then you're looking at everything, you know, what are, what are our employees and all our student groups, and we can't just say student housing, um, because, I don't know, let's just pretend we sprinkle, you know, t we have just the ability to get housing, a couple units in between these neighborhoods and those neighborhoods and those neighborhoods, you know? Maybe students, the things that I've been hearing the last couple of years is students want a certain type of lifestyle that a four-year school would offer, that freshman dorm experience. And that's one way of looking at housing. The other would be a housing that literally offers shelter, rest, you know, you want a place to live, park, and come to work. And so 
I, again, I just I think it's more complex and I wouldn't want to have a goal that says I'm going to look at student housing. If we're going to talk about housing, then let's just talk about housing in the broader sense of the community because that will encompass all of our students, including our employees. Marianne. Um, this discussion um, is a more general issue than housing. And that is uh, we have a tendency to um, simplify the issues uh, and housing is just one of several issues and it seems to me that one of the things we might consider doing about several of these issues is actually um, developing a study we're talking about things where we actually don't have concrete information mm -hmm. For example, we don't know how many of our students live at home and are not interested in housing, and how many really are quite desperate sometimes for housing. We hear the most difficult stories, but we don't actually know what the patterns are. And that's just housing. There are several other things that we bring up at almost every meeting, but we don't actually have concrete information about. And I'm not suggesting we run out and start lots of scientific studies, mm -hmm. but we do need to start gathering some information. And probably we need to go through a process where we identify three or four things that we think keep coming up that we need to talk about more, but we need to gather information about. Peter. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think that that's sort of what I had in mind by the word explore. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to come to any conclusion this year, maybe not next year either. But uh, uh, embedded in the term explore is the gathering of real life data, which we don't have at the moment. Uh, we're, we're guessing. And I just think that if we do that, we have to do it in a way that it doesn't send a message to the community where then we have presentations by future developers saying, oh, we, ha you know what I mean? Like, oh, we're exploring housing, good. Are you guys RFPs? It's like, no. So if we do something like that, then it needs to be worded and crafted in such a way that we're trying to understand the issue, not that we're exploring a ho housing project. So how about um, learn more about and to me, it's not just student housing. I mean, it is our staff and our faculty and our community's concerns about our impact on their housing, even if they're not coming here. So it's, it's a really broader topic to me. So I'm trying to word something that would capture that. Um, it's not just student access and success. It, it's intended to be bigger <laughs> in my mind. Um, but learn about, what was your phrase, explore? Explore. I, I have no objection to what you're saying. I mean, my primary concern and the, the concern mm -hmm. of this board of this college has to do with students. And when I encounter something that seems to impede learning, I'm really interested in that. Uh, I, I, I certainly can feel sympathetic to faculty and staff who live a distance away, but it's, for me, it's not the same thing. There were choices made about that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but nevertheless, I'm happy to make, uh, make this a sort of a broader omnibus study of, of housing generally as it affects Santa Barbara City College, faculty, staff, and students. Okay. And, and with emphasis on the exploration, we're, we're, not, we're not even close to making decisions, but I think looking forward, thinking that we're going to be, at some point, having to make decisions, I'd prefer to make them with data than with assumptions. How about, um, sorry, Craig, I'll get right. right to you after this. I'm thinking that it's a standalone. It doesn't, it's not just student access, it's not just community, it's not just fiscal, and it's not under, I mean, we do have something under college board relationship, but you're talking broader. So I'm suggesting a second, uh, a sixth item, which is um, explore and learn about um, housing issues. I have language. Okay. 
Jonathan? Uh, and support efforts by the college to explore the issue of housing and engage with community stakeholders to do so. Is that, I think the last part is maybe Hang too operational. You went way too fast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, support efforts by the college to explore the issue of housing, and we could put the issue of student and workforce housing, or none of that, and then, and engage with community stakeholders to do so. All right. Lower again, support efforts by the college. Support efforts by the college to explore the issue of housing and engage with community stakeholders to do so. To explore, not to. Yeah, to, to explore. explore. Yeah. explore. Yeah. Okay. I, I like the insertion of both student and workforce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, I, we're, though I'm concerned about housing generally in the county of Santa Barbara, that's, that's not where I want to spend my time. Yeah, yeah but it, it was an issue in the bond. Mm -hmm. If our community is not comfortable with us, yeah. we will not get another bond. So I think it's a bigger package here. We can't just stop at saying um, students and faculty. We have to see the big picture and learn support efforts to learn. That does it. Well, okay, but that yeah. provides, that's the context. Yeah. Uh, looking at student and, and uh, workforce housing will necessarily engage us in looking at the broader picture mm -hmm. uh, because it isn't just our problem. It is a right. larger community problem. And it's, you know, it's not just our community that has this problem. I think we're aware of that too. Uh, Craig, you were having a comment a while back and. Yeah, I'm fine with the language that you recommended. I, I don't really see a, a need for change. I think that's mm -hmm. the direction to go. Um, I, after listening to Marianne's comments and what Peter said, I about the need for data. And yeah, it's always nice to have better, more data and some of the data we haven't collected because there's been reasons for not getting it or it hasn't been available to us. But we do have some data available and the business community seems to recognize that fact and see it even if we don't really grasp it. And it's not just like working with the city of Santa Barbara. We have the city of Goleta. We have the whole district that we serve. And so, um, and yeah, there there is all the issue of the students, the faculty, the staff. You know, how do we all, how do we make this a better life? Um, we probably can never achieve perfect utopia, but over time, w we can cope with some of this in better ways than we have. And I think uh, interacting with our community and listening to those, to the real estate developers, to the bankers, to the industry, the business leaders in our district, that operate within our district, they can give us a lot of these answers. And we see that, that they act on the information they have and what they do and what they've done in the past. Um, we recently had, because it's been talked about the most lately, is Mr. St. George and wanting to do something on his own across the street from us there, and he bought the property. There's a, and I'm not, I'm not involved in that, it's not, and it's not our decision and we're not doing that, but there's a businessman willing to invest a lot of money. So he must see a real need. And does the college really understand what that businessman sees and why he would put all those millions of dollars there? I mean, it's really important. What, what kind of economic shift does, do, do these business, business people see? We see changes coming in Isla Vista. We see possible changes in demographics and the, in the age and the students of the population and where they're gonna live and where, maybe not where they're gonna live, but where they're not gonna live. We see purchases made by, say, UCSB that's gonna possibly change the demographics of Isla Vista. Where's, where is this housing gonna move to? I don't have these answers, but some people in our community have some really good educated guesses about it and we should be engaged in communications on a very active basis with these people so that we're at the top of the loop instead of chasing it a year or two behind, um, which is kind of what I feel we've sort of been doing. And, you know, I would just that's comment, all I had to add. I would just comment that I think we will be engaged as a college in understanding those issues ourselves better than they will because we have enrollment issues. We have been declining in our enrollment, um, which I think is something the community has not recognized, mm -hmm. perhaps even the business community. Um, so it, that's why it's part of a bigger picture to me. Um, somebody else was talking, wanting to talk. Was it 
Well, just Veronica. I just you know, I just want to when I think of this. So our goals directly translate to Dr. Beebe's goals, and when I think of Dr. Gaskin, this was an issue that consumed and took up a lot of her time. And so when I look at the priorities of the college and when I look at the excitement of the things and all the different initiatives that are underway and that sports pavilion last week, I think there's a lot of things that are important. Is that the most pressing thing you, we wanna put on a goal that would then require Dr. Beebe to go out and do or can we just leave it under support the president and community? I think that in his wisdom, he's aware of this and he's gonna be able to find venues to address it in a way that doesn't make it seem like we have to make it a goal that's gonna task him to do something, that's gonna task someone else to do something because what we do is going to affect his job and then he's gonna, it's gonna affect everyone under him and I don't want to do that because I feel like this is needy and the community focus I think that he knows and is well aware of the things and the issues that are going on in the community. And I want to yield all the like, confidence to say, take your first year to learn about the community. I guarantee you housing is going to be one of the top things that's going to come up. Then you come to us, and then we, you will probably on your own want to do this study that Marianne is suggesting, just out of wanting to understand. And then you will come to us. And I would rather us go that way than have to measure ourselves under such a broad, big, complicated thing and then have to measure his performance on that and then measure the college. It just, to me, it doesn't make sense considering how much time and what it did to our former president. And that is our only employee and so their time is coveted. It's, it's special and they are answering to so many people and we need them to be focused on some of the most pressing things that the college is focused on. And, and I'm not saying it's not important. What I am saying is that I trust Dr. Beebe to know that this is a big issue, that you've Googled before you even took this interview, that you've read, you've read the newspapers, you heard in the interviews, and that you know that the community, I'm sure, has already contacted you about this. I mean, your survey, I'm sure, told you some things about this. I was just gonna mention that. Yeah. So I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't wanna put this on something that's gonna make it a priority, that's gonna trickle down and make the institution do anything. Did you want to comment on yeah, that? Yeah, I do, I do want to comment on that. I really appreciate um, your thinking about that because this can be all-consuming for not only myself but the staff and, and everything else. And we're here to serve, we're here to please, and you know, this can be something that kind of takes us away from you know, some of these other very important things. I mean, not that this isn't important, but um, I like the idea of having a broad kind of conversation about this. It's one that's obviously important to all of us. It's important to the community. Having a broad focus exploration of this. Um, maybe we could put together some kind of an ad hoc group to help kind of guide that exploration. Um, but we do need more information about, um, about what it is that we're, we're trying to grapple with here. And I think by getting that information, it'll help shape the direction that we ultimately want to go. So I. Um, as Trustee Kugler suggests, I think that's a really good starting point. Frankly, a lot of the information's out there. We just haven't gathered it together to focus it on what it is that we're talking about. Um, so I think that would be the first step with all of this. And I, I would suggest maybe an ad hoc group of the, of the board to help explore this. Right. We had talked about that idea for our next agenda for next time um, so that we could bring the group to focus on it and then bring information back to the larger group. So what kind of language would you feel comfortable with or would you l prefer, I mean, I'm willing to go along with whatever you want. Well, I think uh, Marcia's, from what Jonathan proposed here and what Marcia has down here, looks like it's kind of heading in the right direction. It's not too prescriptive. Um, it's not, we're talking about you know, ends here from the board's perspective where we don't want to get into the means part of it because that's what, that's what we do. Um, so I, I think what Marsha's got here might, might kind of serve its purpose. What do you have there, Marsha? Well, I may not have captured exactly what Jonathan had, but what I have right now is, <laughs> I know, <laughs> so what I have right now is support efforts, uh, and maybe we just eliminate by the college, to, I'm trying to make it shorter, um, support efforts to explore the issue of both student and workforce housing and community impacts and learn about these issues. Mm -hmm. Does that? Pretty much it. 
capture does that work for yeah you? that works for me okay that's fine Marianne's got president there's a certain degree I don't I, I'm worried as Veronica is about too much going on to the college here um, I do think it's uh, or even consuming your time uh, two things we've leapt to that I didn't mean and maybe if you're if you intentionally want to leap to those things, that's okay, but that's not what I meant. I was specifically not asking the college to do the research. I, I think that is uh, too heavy a burden given what we expect of the college leadership. I was asking that there be research, right. not who did it and would not support having uh, Dr. Beebe spend his time doing the yeah. research. The second part of that is I was not, I was trying to keep open the idea that housing may not be the first issue that should be researched. I am not sure. I am not saying that it's not a problem. Obviously, we're hearing about that all the time. But then we also know that, for example, traffic on the Mesa and some of the recent incidents mm -hmm. in terms of traffic on the Mesa are also a major issue. I imagine that the board could come up with five or eight or 20 major issues. What I'm asking for is a process or a time for us to decide what we think the major issues might be and then support for Dr. Beebe to set up whatever he believes is an appropriate way to do the research, but not himself. Um, I got and I, I guess I wasn't clear enough about those two things because I don't want us to jump to housing if that's not the, the first most critical issue. So then maybe we don't even have, we don't have a goal for that. We don't add it, just wait till something comes up, right? No, yeah. I'm suggesting that we go through a serious planning process right. uh, where we have the opportunity to work with Dr. Beebe mm -hmm. and discuss and rank what we think are the things we need to hear about and the information needs to be gathered about. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wait until one of, you know, any of these things cause tragedies or problems. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to have us do it in a way that is um, intentional. So would so. your comment fit with this language, which I can repeat again? Yes, it would. Are you okay mm -hmm. with this language? This language is currently <coughs> support efforts. It's not put on the college to explore the issue of student and workforce housing, or the issues of student and workforce housing and community impacts and learn more about them. Yes. And I also think your idea of having a small group of board Ad hoc group. Uh, work on this is useful. Would, would this be an opportunity to have a small group from the board as well as a, uh, combined with a small group from mm -hmm. the community yeah. To as well as uh, student representatives to to present and and, and explore together. The, the the nature of an ad hoc committee is that it can have up to three board members and operate with any number of additional support folks, and that gives it a fair amount of flexibility. And then um, there may be other structures. I mean, it may be that when we talk to some other people who would be interested in this in the community that there's a different or better structure. But that was one that came to mind for our typical approach. Um, so I would put that into our hopefully next time discussion. But Sure. So I think you've got you okay? it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've, got, I've got a couple things. Oh, Marty, go. Um, the uh, under accreditation, just a simple thing. You said support the college in preparation and submission of blah, blah, blah. I don't think we're going to be doing anything having to do with the preparation. Um, so no, I we're not actually doing that. It was I know, the support but, it, but that's fine. You could read it that way. 
And, yeah. um, and I think it needs to have a deadline date on it. I don't know what the deadline is on that, but we need a deadline date on it. I think it's, I don't even remember. Uh, we it's need to March, do a, it's March due, 17th, I, I think it Whatever is. Whatever it is, we should add it to yes, that, just I so everybody March knows. March 17th. And then the other thing is, um, we've dropped, um, we have dropped the facilities master planning. And I know we have slowed, we have taken that consultant off of no, it. No, we haven't dropped it, I mean, but you mean as a here, goal? As a goal, okay. and we're almost at the end of it. And I really think it needs to be there no matter how we get there. Um, I and I, because we're almost there, and it's very important for us to have a facilities master yeah. plan. No, that's a good point. There's um, a lot of work that's already been done on it. A lot it. of work's already been done, and we're committed to finishing that up. Good. And so, and so I think that should be on a board goal, just because we had it last year too. So I don't okay, know. well we'll double check the date. All right. So can and we have accreditation check? thing? Okay. And let's see, where do we want to put? The Josh, tell me I was right. I believe. Seventeenth. March seventeenth. Is it March? Okay. Yeah. Let me just say okay. I'm. It's I'm, in March. I'm comfortable. It's March. I'm just, just the date. The day was. Yeah. Not I just quite want to so. make sure it gets in on time. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> As does everybody else. So there. We don't have a facility. Do you want it under fiscal? Facility complete. Fi yeah, support com support completion of. How about under fiscal? Support completion of facility master plan. Sure, it doesn't matter. I don't know where else it would go. I mean, could go under. Well, fiscal makes the most sense. Yeah, I mean it's mm -hmm. part of our fiscal mm -hmm. planning mm -hmm. in that sense. Okay, that's good. Thanks. It's a little hard this year because it, the goals that we have are not, they aren't translated straight into goals that Dr. Beebe has. And before we've done that, we're just been one, two, three, four, five on each side. So it's a little hard um, for me to read them and reconcile them, but it, you know, but they're good. Okay. Well, I do think we've tried to integrate that, and no, I know we have for you. And, and then ways, so, yeah. I know that in in addition, it will be passing down through the college. So we have to think about it in those terms. Right, and they'll be on the website too. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have a bullet point added to support completion of uh, facility management plan. No, master plan. Master plan. I'm sorry. You're right. And we have a new, we have under accreditation, we're adding uh, support the college in the submission of the follow up report due to ACCJC March 17, 2016. 15. 15. Thank you. March 15. And ongoing implementation, blah. Um, and then we have number six, new number six. And I don't have a title for that. Do we have, do we care? We don't have That's to. What do you mean title? You mean just to everything else? Oh, has everything a, else has a title. Yeah, just put housing. Okay. I mean that's and what it is, right? Yeah. All right, we'll do housing. Um, and so that's a new number six title: housing support efforts to explore the issues of student housing and workforce housing and community impacts and learn more about them. Okay. You could put it under number three, though. Community focus. I don't mean to be mixing this up, but hmm? having to do with community focus. You mean move it under there? Okay. Yeah, it's it, it seemed like it was different. a bit of yeah. everything. That's sure. why I sort of broke it out. Okay. Um, so with that, we had Angie. Who made the motion? Wait, hold on. Oh, Veronica. <laughs> I learned to turn it on. <laughs> I talked to Marianne a lot. Okay. Uh, <laughs> go to the bathroom. So under build a stronger board in number four, you know, it's, it's just to me, it's, some of this is kind of wordy. And the, when I read it, it's not just support the president, it's like support the president and these things. And it's almost getting into the means. And, and I would like these to be a little bit more broader because what if you don't get to something by the end of the year or, I mean, so why do we have to support him on these specific things? Like, why can't we just support him to address whatever issues he tells us are important? Do we have to be that specific? I mean, is that getting us too into like how he's supposed to do it? I, I think that as a board that you're getting into a little bit of the means in there versus just saying we have a broad goal that we wanna support the superintendent on major issues. And because 
I mean, right now, yeah, the college vision is something they're doing, but what if something else comes up? And I just feel like, what if we tie ourselves down to measuring ourselves and then measuring our superintendent against something that may or may not be pressing? We don't know what's gonna be pressing in 2016, 2017. I, I think all three of these mm -hmm. have already been discussed as things that we were anticipating for this year, which is why they were in there, but. Um, well, like uh, engaging the board early on in decisions. I mean, staff and I, PC, we've all talked about the importance of that. So that that is something that we're already actively moving <coughs> forward on. I don't think these are so specific necessarily that that they're directing me in a very prescriptive way. I think they they leave flexibility in terms of how I'm going to engage you earlier on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Does I mean, help? I know you've been addressing, um, certainly talking about the college development of the college vision. Um, we've been talking about the issue of scaling and a college conversation about scaling the size of the college. We covered that with the enrollment management discussion. Um, certainly we've been talking about housing. And <laughs> um, fiscal stability has also been, I mean, essentially the product, the whole subject of the retreat. So. I don't think we're picking topics that are surprises, am I? Right, no, I think, I think these are, this is kind of what we've been talking about, so I think we're okay, but I appreciate you yeah. trying to protect me, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, like I said, we just, you know, I, my, our last president was Dr. Gaskin, and she, you know, she, you know, we're, she expressed, you know, the things that she needed, and so I just think that as you enter a new relationship, then you have to be aware of what your previous president told you, and so why would that be any different if she was at the same college, the same community, and so, yes, you guys are two different people, but some of the issues are the same, and if there were some things that were too much, it's like, well, why would we put them back on there type of thing? But if we're, look, we're thinking that this is all doable and possible, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't want to send a message to the college that we are just going to embark in this, you know, unrealistic uh, venture this year. But because when you look at student success and access alone, that's a lot of work. That, and the college has been so dedicated to that, but it takes a lot. And so that, that is my own thing. But I think if you guys are all comfortable and Dr. Ruby's comfortable, then then we're good. I would just comment one of the things that Anthony and I talked about in the context of goals was that many of these goals won't be one-year goals. Right. I mean, they will be long-term goals, and we don't expect him to, to check off this list in a year by any means. We expect to have them continue um, into the future. So. Yeah. That's a good point, ongoing, continuing. I mean, we talked about quite a few of these that will be ongoing. Yeah, so. so you're, you're saying essentially that there's no achievement benchmark at the end of each one of these where we definitely by the end of the year will check it off and done. No, well, I don't see it towards. done. Progress but, toward, but I don't see right. it done in our, <laughs> for that, most that's, of these. That's yeah. consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? So going back to, who made the motion? All right, so Trustee Hasland, with these changes, are you comfortable um, with your motion to approve? Incredibly <laughs> comfortable. <laughs> Good, and Jonathan, your second? Definitely. All right, <coughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Guess we're there. Okay. And by the way, folks, I really appreciate that everybody is engaged in this discussion. That's good. <laughs> we don't have to agree, and we are really discussing it. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Okay, we're moving on to another interesting topic. Um, I'd kind of like to talk about 6.2 and 6.3 together. Does that make sense to you? Because I think okay. they're related. All right. Do you want to do the intro? So, the this you want to talk about board subcommittees and the revisions yeah, to the board. I mean, I think this fits. Well, you know, I mean, the board subcommittee discussion is really something that you all need to talk about. But um, one idea that's come up is is that you know maybe we need to revisit the the charge of the the subcommittees themselves. And whether or not we should continue in that format, I think you know the the uh, facilities 
um, committee was a good example. Um, everybody came, spent resources, time, treasure, trying to get to the to the subcommittee meeting for facilities, which was a valuable meeting. Don't get me wrong, but um, you know it was 15 minutes, and it could have been very well discussed right here. Um, you know, at a, at a full board meeting, and in some ways, you know, that can be more transparent. Mm -hmm. um, it can be more transparent the discussion. It can also be more efficient in terms of um, your all time and staff time to be able to have that here if uh, there isn't something that is um, challenging or controversial or controversial or something that needs further discussion. If it is something that's one of those those areas, then obviously we could have an ad hoc board committee meeting about that to explore it in more more depth and detail. Um, so the, the discussion has been kind of, maybe we need to look at and review the charge of the, the board subcommittees and find out if we want to continue the current structure that we have or maybe look at something a little different. And then in conjunction with that, why don't you talk about the agenda changes? Because I think that's where it relates, okay. the, and the notice. So right now we have consent items, what we call consent items on the agenda. And um, for every, every uh, topic that we have in the agenda, um, staff come up and, and talk about, about these items. Some of them can be very perfunctory. They can be non-controversial, very... Um, kind of standard kinds of things. Um, many times you don't have any questions about it anyway. So the idea is, is that we would create a consent agenda, and that consent agenda would be those items that are perfunctory, non-controversial, um, standard kinds of things, benign kinds of topics that need to have board approval but don't need some kind of elaborate explanation. And the way that we do that is, is that you go through each one of the areas in the board agenda and you pull out things that need, a f need further explanation. And we know, we, myself and staff, know about what those items are gonna be in advance so that we can be prepared to give you a robust answer about whatever the, the question might be or that the topic might be about. Um, and so you pull those out and then whatever else is left over Rather than having staff come up for each one of those consent items, they're they're passed on a broad, uh, a broad basis, um, and so it it streamlines your work, and it it also streamlines what it is that we're focused on, so that um, you know staff is not not worried about you know some of those kind of details. So that's kind of the idea is is that it's basically what we're doing now, with the exception of. And on those items that are perfunctory, non-controversial, they just kind of go through on consent, and you're really focusing your effort time um, on the ones that are, are that need more explanation. So, so what you're saying is that you would take things from uh, HR and from from uh, Joe's, you know, business services, sh shifting around money or whatever he does every month, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, uh, or facilities and so on, and just put it on a um, consent calendar, which would be at the front of our um, yeah. agenda. And we could look through, and if there's any questions or anything like that, we could ask them, but it should be something that's surely, as you said, perfunctory. But right. I yeah, mean, you're, and that makes sense to me, and then when you go, and when Joe finally does get up here, it's something that's really got some meat on it. Exactly. Or he could be at home because they were so easy. <laughs> yeah, right? So I got it, that's good. I like okay. that. I mean, in, in conjunction with that, I think we were also talking about the idea of maybe pushing up the notice a little, if we can. To yeah, so we'd, you know, we'd be able to, to get the, the Brown Act notice out maybe a day or two earlier. Um, maybe Friday instead of Monday? Yeah, maybe Friday, in, in, you know, Angie and I kind of talked about that a little bit. So get it out Friday instead of, you know, Monday. That would give us, you know, we'd have to back into it. And staff would have to kind of adjust what it is they're doing. Now, we, we always have, I'm looking at Pat, we always have TBAs and things that mm -hmm. we're not going to find out about until the last minute. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have to make those kind of adjustments. But if Pat lets me know about those, I can inform you as we're, we're, we're on the fly on that kind of thing. I know Pat and I talked about that. And that's important. I mean, we could have a hiring that somebody has decided they don't want to 
come or whatever it might be. Um, and so we can make those adjustments as, it, as they go along. But the idea, and, and to go back to emphasize something that, that Anthony said uh, about this, is we have more time to read the materials, figure out what our questions may be. We will give Anthony a heads up on what we would want to talk about. In other words, you say, I see this item. I want us to talk about that one. The rest of them I'm fine with their consent. Um, and we have that communication, and it's our responsibility to have that communication with Anthony so that he can, and, and also to convey questions that we have to him. So then when we have a real discussion here, we, our staff is prepared to answer the questions that we have. And that can be, I think, a really fruitful discussion for the entire board and a reason why having the subcommittees where, I mean, we have our board reports, but it's not the same as being in the subcommittee. And so if there's a real issue here, the whole board gets to ask the questions and hear it. Um, and when there's nothing, we don't have to convene a subcommittee to, to say, okay, <laughs> no big <Nothing>. deal. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how they relate. So we didn't do it this time, but the thought was also that this, is a, this can be an experiment, guys. I mean, we can try it out. If it works well, we continue. And if we decide it doesn't, we can always change. So the way I've seen this done in the past, if I may, mm -hmm. is that at the beginning of the meeting, the board chair would ask uh, the board members, um, going through each one of the areas, human resources, business services, and such, do you have any items that you'd like to pull, that you'd like further explanation, that are non-perfunctory, so on and so forth. So we would pull those out, and we would already have a heads up that these are things that you want us to, to provide better information about or whatever it might be. Um, you pull those out and then we'd ask for a motion, board president would ask for uh, a motion to approve the, the consent agenda, which is everything else that's, that's left over. Um, Y'all vote on that so we have a record of, of those things being approved and then uh, we would start with the, the presentation of those items that were pulled out that you want further explanation about. So we're really focusing our efforts around the things that are important to you that you want for their explanation, as opposed to the things that are, you know, the omnibus kinds of things that might be for, you know, hourlies or, I mean, who knows what it might be. So you're really focusing on the things that are important to you. So it can be a richer discussion. Well, it, it seems to me we're doing almost that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the larger agenda, we go through and, and, uh, but the only difference would be that we're, we're voting on each category. And uh, I, have, I would have no objection to the process that you're suggesting. I, I don't know that it's gonna save us a lot of time. I'm more interested in um, the, focusing on the idea of the committees, because it seems to me they do serve a purpose. And maybe what we might wanna talk about is a more effective use of committees uh, I think that if, if a committee agenda is sparse and of no particular moment, uh, the chair of the committee should say, we pass, we, won't, we don't need that meeting. Uh, I think meetings ought to be, uh, if we're going to continue with committees, they should be called because there's something of substance to discuss. The function of a committee is to go into depth about something. Uh, to explore for a longer period of time than is typically available at, at the board meeting. And maybe the outcome of that discussion is uh, nothing. That's, this is not something that we ought to bring to the whole board, it's, it's dead. Or it is, this is something that's really important and we need to bring it to the board's attention. Um, and I think it's just a, a question of difference in focus and the amount of time we allocate to that focus. Veronica? Veronica? I think that that's one of the benefits. I think that, and Marianne can echo in, one of the, I think that the opposite, a con, you know, your pro, your con to that would be, so 
you know, we had our board retreat and we're kind of like, oh gosh, why didn't we know some of this stuff? And then Marianne said, oh, I think we intuitively kind of knew some of these things. And so I think that in fiscal especially, there was a lot going on that because of the Brown Act, we couldn't call, you know, Marty and say, hey, what do you think? Three had already shown up to the meeting. So then when it came to the full board, the same material was presented, but not the same discussion. And so I think that it benefits the board, like Lindsay's wonderful presentation. Everybody hear it, and everybody has an opportunity to ask the questions on Friday night, Saturday morning, whatever time he wants to entertain the questions. And then we all come to the table, and we all have a clean discussion, and everyone's on the same page. There may be times where we mean to call special meetings or things like that, but that's what we sign up to do. We sign up to serve and to do this. I would, much, I would be in favor of not having staff attend four meetings a month, one fiscal one, you know, two board meetings, and having them just do their daily operations and have us free up that time to have discussions, all seven, because regardless, only seven can give direction to Dr. Beebe. So three of us may have a great idea, and he's not gonna run with it unless seven are on board. So that, I think, was, has been sort of um, an issue for the last couple of years. Yeah. And I would add, I have felt like with fiscal in particular, um, it hasn't been fair to those people who are not part of that committee because that discussion that we had was not available to them and mm -hmm. except you know on a tape, but they didn't get to ask their questions. Um, and we really needed to have a full board better understanding of where we were. So I don't know. Marianne, do you have? I, I completely agree. I would, um, it does mean that the likelihood is that our meetings uh, will be longer because people will have questions, fi fiscal questions, for example, that they want to ask. But if we all hear the same questions and the same answers, I think we will function better. And if uh, in an individual issue or case, we need to have a smaller group do homework ahead or so forth. The president and the president certainly have the option of appointing a small group to do that. But it, it, the every month meeting kind of thing, what happens is you get to know each other really well and the subject pretty well, mm -hmm. but it doesn't share across the board. I think that's really the benefit of it. I mean, it's it's the transparency of it, it's the educational part of it, so that we're all on the same page. We're hearing the same topics and issues and debates and, and discussions, and I think that's that's a huge benefit for all of us. Yeah, it might, it could, you know, end up taking us a little bit more time, but I think it's time well spent. Yeah. So we could we could I suppose we could experiment with this. Try it, mm -hmm. and um, and I'm hearing that you're still. The system would still allow for us to appoint a special committee or subset that would look at the, something unique or something that might involve a larger group, including faculty and, and students. Yeah, okay, then. Yeah, the I'm system certainly does that. And there's always the bring forth an agenda item that not otherwise covered mm -hmm. um, part of that system. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, did you have? I love the consent agenda, agenda <laughs> idea. I actually designed, a, I restructured our student government at UCSB to use a consent agenda instead of going through everything. So I, I believe in that so much, so great idea. Um, in terms of committees, I also agree that, I, I think there is a there could be a purpose to a f facilities committee, but I think as of now, I can't think of one that could justify the hour of work that is set aside for our staff and for trustees and for President Beebe. Yeah. So until then, I think I'm on the side that maybe we should look like not have the current structure we have now for committees. I would throw in my support again, I had like a month ago for a legislative committee, but one that's more infrequent in meetings, like you know, four times a year that could look at legislation that's pertinent to the college. But that also could be an ad hoc. That could be an ad hoc, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like an yeah. ad hoc that always happens. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All the committee. All the committee. <laughs> we know the legislature is not always in session. <laughs> <laughs>
Craig. Um, one of the uh, functions of the committees that I learned here um, Craig, you that I had, oh, <laughs> one of the functions of the committees that I didn't, Thank you, Marty. that I didn't hear anybody bring up is, you know, when we get, when we do get new board members and um, like when I came on, I volunteered for committees. Why? Because it's a really good opportunity to get in-depth exposure in a hurry so that you know, so that you can be of more value and do a better job. So I just looked at it in part, not in total, as on-the-job training. Hmm. And now when you remove that, then there's no other avenue for that training to take place except for the new board members to be mentored by other board members or some well, other way. I'm so some other emphasis or or avenues we should think about being able to provide. And most of the time that may not be any big deal as long as we're not having turnover on the board. Mm -hmm. You know, that's cool. But when I came on, there was considerable turnover on the board and that, and I felt I really needed to, to jump in there and figure, you know, and make myself knowledgeable. Yeah, well, I, I think the idea here is to have your on-the-job training in this boardroom in these meetings. And we need a rule as well that there are no dumb questions so that a new new board member does not feel they can't ask a question like that, you know, that, that they are not familiar. Okay. You know, and some of that's on, on myself and staff to provide, you know, study sessions or whatever it might be to kind of help keep us all together on topics like that. But I, you, you bring up a good point. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Well, we're onboarding. Yeah, Dr. Haslam was mentioned. Was, Peter was talking about you know the time, or we were talking. You were discussing the time, the length of the board meetings. Would it make it longer? I don't know that it'd have to make it longer. But if we start the OJT kind of stuff going on, then yeah, it could get quite a bit longer. And and your suggestion about perhaps say if you have a new board member, there is already a kind of a a, a policy to educate new board members and so maybe that's something we have to to remember to an integrate. onboarding process yeah, of some kind i'm sure you yeah. have yeah, yeah something like that okay um okay so are we okay this is discussion only but the idea would be to bring something specific for decision to try it out next time and to actually use this new agenda next time yeah. all right um so now maybe for temporarily the last time we see Pat. <laughs> <laughs> we have a consent item here. Hello and goodbye. It's <laughs> uh, good afternoon or evening now, board members, uh, President Croninger, President Beebe. I'm here to present the consent agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Items 7.1 through 7.4. Tonight I have no changes to make, so I would ask that you consider it as a group. Okay. May I have a motion to approve 7.1 through 7.4? Greg? I move. Second. second. Veronica, second. Uh, any questions, discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Pat. And this previous discussion, nothing personal. We, we <laughs> love seeing you. Thank you. Well, I, I'll still be here. Just and the same case. for everyone. So. Just in case. Okay. Um, I'm also here for item 8.1, mm -hmm. and um, under the heading of exploration or the theme of exploration, before I uh, ask you to take this to a vote because it is a resolution, I'd like to talk to you about it a little bit because this is an item that doesn't come up very often. This is uh, an every four-year item. It's, we have one employee who uh, takes advantage of her right in the education code to invoke a religious exemption from the tuberculosis, freedom from tuberculosis requirement. And some of you were here four years ago when we had this conversation, some of you weren't, so I want to take the opportunity to kind of fill in the blanks or answer questions if you have questions before I ask you for your vote. Um, the Education Code section is very clear about the requirement for, I forgot my glasses, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're really dragging this one out, aren't you? I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Make it longer. Read the fine print in the Ed Code. Okay. Um, the Education Code makes it 
uh, very clear that those individuals who are hired into academic or classified positions, that there's a requirement that they submit a document from their physician that they are free from tuberculosis. They have to present that within the first 60 days, or they have to have had it done within the first 60 days, and then they have to have, have it done every four years following, with a couple of exceptions. One of those exceptions is that at the discretion of the board, the section does not apply to those employees who don't require certification qualifications, so it doesn't apply to staff at your discretion who are employed for a time period of less than a year and whose functions do not require frequent or prolonged contact with students. Keep in mind that this has to do with protecting the health and safety of our students, okay? That isn't the exemption, is my time up? No. no. <laughs> that isn't the exemption under which this person has um, invoked her rights. The section that she's uh, invoked is, if the governing board of a community college district determines by resolution after hearing that the health of students in the district would not be jeopardized thereby, this section shall not apply to any employee of the district who files an affidavit stating that he or she adheres to the faith or teaching of any well-recognized religious sect, denomination, or organization, and in accordance with its creeds, creed, tenets, or principles, depends for healing upon prayer and the practice of religion, and that to the best of his or her knowledge and belief, he or she is free from active tuberculosis. If at any time there should be probable cause to believe that the affiant, that's the person who files the affidavit, I learned, is afflicted with active tuberculosis, he or she may be excluded from service until the governing board of the employing district is satisfied that he or she is not so afflicted. So this individual, as she did four years ago, pr presented me with a notarized affidavit, a letter explaining uh, that she is she is free from tuberculosis. She has not gone through any tests. She's not displaying any symptoms of tuberculosis. Hasn't for the last four years or the last eight years. And it is, in fact, against her religious beliefs to go through this test. She presents that notarized affidavit to me. I am here to say to you that she is not in a position that interacts with students at all. She's not in a classroom environment. Her employment does not her health and her position here don't pose any risk at all to our student population. So, <coughs> hence the resolution that you find on the board agenda this evening. I move to approve the resolution. Okay, so you want to do that order? Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah. I guess I just signed it. Yeah. So we'll take it out of order. Peter, we can take your motion a because we're not at this point in the agenda yet. Um, anybody seconding? Emily? Emily seconds. So now the questions arise, if there are any. Um, I have no recollection of four years ago, but <laughs> <laughs> appreciate your pointing that out. <laughs> um, I mean this issue. I Certainly. remember some things about four years ago. <laughs> uh, that was that was why I wanted to preface this with a bit of an explanation because it is it wouldn't be on the consent agenda, so you'd see me anyway, <laughs> and you know it is kind of an anomaly. It doesn't happen routinely, and it does seem kind of out of the blue. But we did do this four years ago, mm -hmm. and this employee is obviously a current employee who has been employed for a number of years, so it's a recurring event as to this person. That is correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Marianne? I am very torn on this issue. Um, I know it sounds very simple, but as a former administrator in K-12, um, I saw several cases where um, there was a question of religious freedom, a legitimate question. On the other hand, we were talking about measles. And while um, the decision was that at that point that they had the freedom not to get um, any prevention 
taken. Uh, and it was because they didn't deal with children. They did deal with other adults. And in two cases, other teachers caught the measles from these adults and um, had um, children born uh, with some of the impact from the measles. So this is something that I feel very serious about. And I am very concerned about this issue with tuberculosis because as you know, there is increased tuberculosis occurring in, well, probably the world, but our country anyway. Um, on the other hand, I have great faith in you, Pat. Thank you. And so I, I will vote for this uh, with the understanding that I'm counting on you. I feel you. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. And I take it very seriously as well. I'm sure you do. We have been um, <clears throat> most unpopular in, in HR because we are uh, holding the the feet of those who have not complied to the fire about we won't let you back in the classroom until you take care of business because we do take this responsibility very seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can add to this that Pat and I have had a couple hours of discussion about this particular topic and you know a lot of the things that you're bringing up we've, we've talked about. I'm sure. And uh, <clears throat> Pat, as you point out, I mean she takes this very, very seriously yeah. and if there was any chance or possibility of this not being uh, a situation where um, the individual would not be exposed to to students and in any great way, I mean, and, and this person's not, so I, I felt comfortable enough going forward with it. If this individual, for example, were to change positions, change roles within the school, um, this whole that could be a game changer with respect to the exemption and. There's only one individual, so it's not like I'm going to lose track of that person. And the person has not changed jobs since joining the college, so I don't see that happening. Um, Craig and then Veronica. Craig and then Veronica. Okay. Um, I didn't see here that it was where it says here that it's like it was for just one employee that is to allow you to make an exception for anybody that meets those same criteria. Um, if it is just one employee, which it doesn't say here, so I don't really know that. And now I know more than I really wanted to know. <laughs> I, because I didn't want to know it was uh, a her. I didn't really care. Um, um, I, I'm inclined to vote no, simply because it, it provides an exception creates a loophole for what good purpose. I don't know, if it was a doctor saying, no, this person shouldn't do this because they have other conditions and it would be physically harmful to them, that's one thing. But because, because of a belief system, you know, it's a big wide world, you know, not sort of my problem. Um, my, my concern is, as a trustee at, at the school, is about the students and the rest of the faculty and staff. That's what I'm concerned at, that's where my priority is, and you haven't said anything that's gonna make me say, okay, so until I hear, and I'm open to hear and listen, unless I hear something to change my mind, my vote will be no. Veronica, were you making comments? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I echo Marianne and Craig, and I think that it's, um, everybody has a right to choose whatever for their own personal health, and so I respect that, but I don't know that I can guarantee that an individual would not make contact with another adult that then would cross the street to Orphala. And so that's where I get a little kind of weird about that. And so I think I side with Craig, other than I respect everybody to, you know, vaccinate or take tests for whatever they need to because everybody has a free choice to do that. But because we operate a, a child learning center across the street, that's where I kind of was like, whoa. Jonathan. I'm just asking a clarifying question. So my understanding is that last year the state passed a law saying that no children can ever be exempt again from filing an affidavit to get immunization, but that didn't apply to any staff and faculty at a public institution? This is not an immunization. It's right, a, right. It's a test no, to I understand. say that you're free from something. It's not an immunization to prevent something. Right, but 
that like students were not allowed to get that anymore uh, in terms of immunization as of 2015, but it didn't, that didn't apply to faculty and staff. I'm just. We don't I, have any immunization requirements, so I don't know oh, how to respond okay. to you. Okay. Yeah, I think, but, yeah, it's probably the difference between immunization or test for whether you are having, you have this separately. disease. Right. But it's, okay. it's conceptually very similar. Yeah. All I know is when I, uh, when I first retired, I went and substitute taught for a little bit, and I'd never been in a classroom before. And I had to go through all these hoops, and one of them was I had to go get a TB test. Mm -hmm. And after I did it for a while, I had to do another TB test. Yeah. And, you know, there's no ill effects. I didn't notice it. You know, um, I just did it, and everybody did it. And um, it was for the health of everybody that was working together. Um, I... I, I, still, I already said what I had to say, so I guess I should just be quiet. Again, the intention in the education code is to protect the health of our students, and this individual is not in a role that interacts with our students, maybe incidentally in the restroom, any more than our students would interact with other people, members of the public who come on campus. Um, there are probably any number of people who visit the Orfila Early Learning Center that, you know, are members of the public, that are other parents, that are, you know, visitors. They haven't, we don't know if they ha have gone through a freedom from tuberculosis test. We don't know what we don't know. So <coughs> this individual is exercising her rights under the education code, under the, it's uh, in opposition to my religion. Jonathan. Uh, just another question. Are, theoretically, if this person gets tuberculosis and passes it on to someone, are we liable for making this exemption? I don't know. Legal question. Liable for? For someone getting tuberculosis. No. No? Well, if they got it because this employee didn't get their test. It's... It's a good legal question, and I don't know the answer. Do we have a timing issue that where that could be asked, or do we have? Um, um, I can follow up with that. I this person is due now, which is why why I'm bringing this to you now. Mm -hmm. So the four year cycle is right now. Um, I guess I, if you'd like me to follow up with legal counsel to get an answer to Jonathan's question, I can and bring this back if you'd like. That's strikes me as a concern. standard of care, perhaps, or something like that, but I don't know. I mean, it, it's a... Uh, so we can, we can uh, get some legal counsel on that. That's not a problem. Maybe we could also talk with a uh, medical uh, epidemiologist or something in terms of the exposure of this. I mean, there's, there's mm -hmm. two routes, if you'd feel more comfortable with that. I mean... I don't, I don't know if we should delay it. I'm just, I was just asking if maybe anyone knew that if this employee transfers, gets TB because they didn't get the test, gives it to someone, incidentally, it's traced back to coming from one of our employees that we exempted, are we then liable for that person who got TB? I think it would be pretty difficult to trace something back as TB is an airborne, it's communicated airborne. You could get it at the grocery store. You could get it at the car wash. You could get it by interacting with our employee who we exempted, who has no symptoms, uh, has displayed no symptoms. That's been verified by her doctor. So I'm not sure you could ever trace that back to uh, where it came from. I'm suspecting we're, be we're beyond our expertise yeah. on this question. <laughs> um, Marty or Peter, any comments? Just Marty? This is, this is um, I just don't see the big issue because this is something that is, everybody wants to have freedom of religion in, Santa, in um, the United States, so that's not a question. Um, and if it's part of your religion not to have the test and there is an exemption in the, in the education code provided, mm -hmm. I just, I'm having trouble seeing where that's a problem. If there was no exemption in the education code, then we would have a big problem. But I since there is one, mm -hmm. I think this is fine. I think 
my sense of it is people are struggling with the part of the resolution that says the health of the students in the district would not be jeopardized if well, that person she, didn't have a, a test. Uh, no, I, I'm just, doctor's I think I'm affidavit. hearing that. I know, yeah. I, I hear that too, and I yeah. understand everybody's concerned, but, but she's got a doctor's you know, affidavit. And it's filed, I understand, probably with HR. Is it the doctor's HR, affidavit so. or the employee's affidavit? It's her affidavit that, that says that she has, been, she has been to her doctor, but yeah. she's not displaying any of the symptoms. Yeah. And th no, there's no. a list of what the symptoms yeah. are. So, okay. Peter? Did I you? think it's a matter of weighing risk mm -hmm. on the one hand right. and uh, religious freedom on the other. And uh, I, I see the risk factor as having been evaluated as uh, very, very remote. If this were a case of measles, I think I'd, I'd be very concerned. Well, I would be too. I'd, yeah. I'd agree with uh, Trustee Kugler yeah. <laughs> and say, no, we don't want to do it. So, uh, you know, and I, I, uh, I think the risk is minimal and I would, I would support this. I, I think it doesn't preclude us moving ahead and getting legal advice for the future. If we find that we were wrong, then next at the next meeting, somebody might move to rescind this. Yeah. But I, I don't think we will. I think we'll find that, that there is this section of the Ed Code that has been carefully thought out and that it's, it, it's designed to provide relief for precisely this kind of situation. If there's any uh, assurance that I can provide I did seek legal counsel four years ago because it was the first time I'd ever faced this kind of a request. So um, I did consult with legal counsel at that, at that point. I didn't do it again this time because I did it before. And, and the advice was? It proceed that she's exercising her rights. If she presents what she has presented, you know, I needed to find out what she needed to do or he, um, and that those uh, requirements were met, and then I brought it to you, and life went on for four years. Okay. Uh, Marianne. Uh, despite the fact that I am concerned about this, uh, there is the law, and it is very clear that we would uh, have to have a legal reason not to approve it. Right. So I will vote for it. Even, you know, I've expressed my concern. Well, I and I trust Pat. Mm -hmm. I think the tricky part goes to kind of what Jonathan's saying. So if it's Ed Code, it should just stand by itself. Why does the board need to approve it? So, like, you're kind of like, if Ed Code says only if your board is okay with it. And so that's so Jonathan's saying, well, am I okay with this? Because now I'm saying that I'm okay with maybe putting people at risk. So that's where the tricky part comes in. Ed Code should just write it and say, do it. And that's it. We follow Ed Code. But Ed Code's saying, you can do it if the board is okay with it. And I think that that goes back to what you're saying. Well, then why do we need approval? What's the liability or what's the, you know, anyway, it's just fancy legal. So why, right. have, a, why have a resolution in the first place? Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, one thing I think I can help with, which is that we amend the resolution to say due to one employee's limited, because mm -hmm. I think Craig was suggesting that it wasn't quite clear. Is that okay, Pat? Absolutely. Um, and then I think we're struggling with this one, but we do need to vote. So, um, and we, we already did the motion and approve, right? I remember doing that. Okay. It's a resolution, so. No. Trustee Carlson Torn, but <laughs> aye. Trustee Kugler? Aye. Trustee Hadley? Aye. Trustee Whitworth? <laughs> aye. Trustee Bush? Aye. Trustee Whitworth? No. So it passes. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. I Thank mean, this you. is this is not an easy issue, and we appreciate that you have given us a good explanation. Yeah. Yes, you did. <laughs> she said, "I." <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we got some tough ones today. Mm. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> um, 
He's backing up. One, two, three, personnel. Yep. We're on nine now. Yep, stipends. Uh, on the previous issue, if, if we are going to ask for additional legal counsel, uh, might it also be useful to know, you know, what are the consequences? Should we say no? Are there consequences to that employee? Will they be, in fact, terminated? And I think that would, that should be known. I'm assuming the answer to that is already yes. I, I mean, that it's a requirement unless you're exempted. Yeah, I'm sorry, Pat. Sorry, Pat. Thank you, Angie. <laughs> mm -hmm. The religious objection, I believe, is related to having um, the um, having the foreign substance, having the actual germs or or the substance applied to the skin. There may be other uh, approaches which are fairly new, which involve blood tests, where you're testing the blood as opposed to having a skin test. It's significantly more costly, that approach, than the skin test. So. Okay. Um, perhaps we can come back with the information on the legal advice yeah, and anything like else that, yeah. relevant yeah, next we'll time. It'll give you four years to figure this one out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could, we could also reconsider if we feel we have to, but. We will come back with the legal um, opinion on that. Okay. Craig? I, I don't understand Peter's point about, well, would this mean they'd, that that employee would lose their job? Because that may or may not be the case, and it may not. Yeah. But um, I don't think that is should enter in we should just think about the welfare of the employees and the students as a whole right. and not one person's job yeah, i agree with that um, okay so i but i kind of misunderstood what you meant by that i pardon me okay are we now ready to move on to educational programs paul <laughs> i know you've been standing there <laughs> Unless you find uh, Viking knitting or uh, tortillas uh, problematic, this will be quick. <laughs> um, so I do want to make a correction before we proceed uh, in item 9.1. Um, for stipends, we've listed uh, Marilyn Armstrong. Uh, her first name is actually Barbara. She goes by Jordy, so nobody knew her real first name, I guess. But um, So that's the only correction I would like to make. But other than that correction, uh, I would like to recommend for your approval uh, uh, item 9.1, stipends for faculty. And we also have item 9.2, which are proposed courses. We have 16 courses, uh, among them Viking knitting and uh, all about tortillas, uh, for the Center for Lifelong Learning. Okay, can I have a motion to approve 9.1, 9.2? I so move. Emily moves, Jonathan seconds. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Paul? Thank you. Thank you. And Joe? Okay, I bring you the Business Services Consent Agenda, and it's items um, 10.1 through 10.8. Um, I just wanted to comment on one of the items, the grant agreement for providing funds to the City of Santa Barbara to administer enforcement of the City's noise abatement ordinance. That's the SNAP program, which you're all very familiar with, that mm -hmm. the Neighborhood Task Force has brought. Um, okay. And so with that. Okay, may I have a motion to approve? approve. Um, and then we'll have any questions. Um, so we are, what are we, nine? I'm sorry, Joe. We're going 10.1 through 10.8. 10 10.8. 10 All right. Motion to approve. Ten I so move. Marianne moves. Second. 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 Okay. Any questions? 
I just had one, which is I think the current status is we're in the uh, purchase orders. We're not, we don't have one anymore for 3B Plum. Is that correct? No, that purchase order was canceled. This is a timing okay. issue. So we're not approving one for that in this case, basically. Well, actually you are, but it's already been canceled. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> because of the timing of it. Yeah. It's okay. the timing of it. We, we submitted it to okay. the board. And then Joe and I did talk about that, so. All right, got it. Emily. I just want to thank you, Joe. I know how much hard work you've been putting in um, regarding the SNAP program, and I just wanted to especially um, extend a thank you on behalf of all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Any other comments, questions? Jonathan. Yeah, I really look forward to seeing how this program plays out and how successful it is, because I, we're trying to do one in Isla Vista similar, so yeah. I can't wait to see it. This is good. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Nope. And then we have one action item. It's resolution number four, and it's a budget transfer between major objects. And it's just one budget transfer this month. Mm -hmm. And this is a resolution, so Angie gets, we need a motion first, right? Okay, motion to approve the resolution. Move approval. Peter moves, who's second? Jonathan, second. Angie. Aye. 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 Thank you very okay, much. Okay, pass us. And that takes us. Oh, Marianne. Just very quickly. I have never been part of an institution before who did such a careful and thoughtful job of um, meeting the results of a committee recommendation, especially a community committee. And I just want to say to you how very proud and impressed I am with this group. Mm -hmm. And this is the MESA task force you're referring yes, to. Referring yes. To well, it's wonderful to see the progress. And, and thank you, Joe, for all the work you've done, because it's not just the task force, which you and Marty were worked very hard on, it's the follow-up. <laughs> it's the board. I mean, you all are the ones that had to implement this, and so thank you to all of you. Well, and it's also the city that, city that is worked with us and, and put this in there, so I'm, I'm right. going to be really interested, like Jonathan, to see how it works. I hope it works very yeah. well. Mm -hmm. We all do. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Well, we're adjourned, and thank you for a pretty interesting meeting. <laughs> <laughs>